All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, it's nice to see so many. It's good to see so many faces. How's everyone doing today? I don't know. Hey, Kyle. Are we on now? That's better. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the June 14th meeting of the Charles County Board of Education. Can we please start by saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the first item on our agenda is the contract with uh, AFSME. And then after that, followed by the contract. Sir, I, I, right. We can't hear you all the way in the back. You know, wow. Is that better? Yes. Is that better? How's that? No, it's not better. <laughs> hmm. I can hear. Ooh. Whoa. All right. We'll try that again. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, sir. So uh, the first, and this will just take a couple of minutes, um, we're going to sign the contracts. Uh, with AFSME and with the EACC. The classroom voice. There we go. That works. Okay. I think we're good to go now. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. All right, so good afternoon, board members and all those assembled. My name is Nikki Majors. I am the Assistant Superintendent for the Office of Human Resources. And I have the pleasure to present the ceremonial signing of our negotiated agreements, which go into effect July 1st, 2022. So both our employee advocacy groups are present today. And I just want to thank each and every one of the team members who will be represented today because these individuals have worked very, very hard and spent a lot of time bargaining in order to secure the best outcomes for their members as well as our workforce. So first up, I'd like to invite Ms. Sarah Birch from ASME, our Support Staff Employees <laughs> Union. Sarah will introduce her team and Sarah is the president of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 67? No, Local 29. 2981. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so Miss Sarah, you introduce your team members. Okay, um, Kwame. You want to come? Kwame's our representative from Council 67, and his name is Kwame Rose. Charla. Charla was on our negotiating team. She's the perfect person to be on a negotiating team. Char Charla Hilliard. And Mr. James Earl Swan. Where is Mr. Swan? <laughs> and he represents our building service people. He works at La Plata High School. And before we sign, we just want to officially ask our Board of Education if they are approving the contract that we have negotiated for ASME. To make a motion. So the chair will entertain a motion to approve the ASME contract. So moved. Second. It's moved by Ms. McGraw, it's seconded by Ms. Wilson. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is a unanimous vote among the voting members. Awesome. All right, thank you very much. So now at this time, we will ask our ASME representatives to sign our contract. So let's open our folder. Everybody have a pen, and you will sign 
on the dotted line where you see your name. <laughs> okay, we have all of our Ask Me bargaining team members. And next up, we'll have our Charles County Public Schools representatives come up for signature. Sarah, did you want to say anything while they're making their way down? I just thanked all the board members for all the help they've been, and Dr. Navarro, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you. Okay, first we will have come down Ms. Diana Colomo. She is a member of the Charles County Public Schools negotiating team, followed by Ms. LaCoria Conti, HR specialist who served on our bargaining team. Dr. Linda Gill is not here today. She's on business travel. And so you may sign. And so we will um, obtain her signature when she returns. Then we have Mr. David Shimizu, manager of compensation and HRIS. Mr. Michael Heim, our Assistant Superintendent for Supporting Services, served on our team this year. He's been a recurring member of the bargaining team. Then we have Ms. Terry Lunzow, one of our executive assistants who has served with us for a couple of years now. And I will sign while, while Ms. Kelly Scherer, our, one of our budget professionals, is making her way down for signature. Ms. Scherer keeps us straight when it comes to the finances. Ms. Kelly Scherer. And then I will ask Chairperson Michael Lucas to come down and sign, followed by Superintendent Dr. Maria Navarro. All right, that concludes our Ask Me contract signing. So we thank all of the members of uh, Charles County Public Schools who represented uh, their various populations and participating in negotiations. You did a wonderful job, and I don't know what we would do without you. So thank you so much. So next I will invite up Mr. Sean Heil, who is the current president of the Education Association of Charles County. And I will ask Mr. Heil to introduce the bargaining team for the EACC, who represents our certificated professionals. And Ms. Don Pipkin, our Uniserve Director for EACC. And we're gonna let our negotiations uh, assistant, with support, uh, announce the team. So thank you for this recognition. Uh, we're gonna ask the team to come up. I first wanna recognize we have some team members that who couldn't be here today. Ms. Leslie Shrek was our co-chief negotiator, longtime EACC member,
contract specialist and uh, served in the negotiations co-chair role the last few years. She's retiring this year and is a celebrating that with the staff at La Plata. So we wish Leslie the best. Uh, Matthew Howard also served on our team. He was a high school teacher member of the team and isn't able to be here. And Miss Sonia Blue, who's the principal at Meta Woman Middle School, isn't able to be here for the signing today. But I'm gonna ask my colleague, Dan Besick, who was co-chief negotiator, please come up and sign. Oh, Mr. Jacob Girding, who is a library media specialist no. at Higdon Elementary School. Do we need to make a motion first? We need to make a motion first. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> So board members, yeah. we would like your approval of the EACC <laughs> contract that was negotiated this year. Each of you would have received summaries of our contract negotiations with the highlights of what language changes we made and what we all agreed on. Sure, so at this time, the chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. It's moved by Ms. Sable, seconded uh, by Ms. Wilson. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. And just like to add, you know, this is this is possible because of the of uh, the funding we received from our Charles County commissioners, and uh, two of them are here today. So thank you very much. So as I said, Jacob Girding, library media specialist at Higdon Elementary, served as a valuable member of our team. Miss Linda Stocks, pupil personnel worker at Davis Middle School, was also a part of the EACC negotiations team. Mr. Darnell Russell, principal of McDonough High School, was also part of our team and rounded out our team. Our team is combined, Unit 1 and Unit 2, both educators who are school-based and central office-based, including administrators. And we're just very proud of the work that everyone was able to do this year and the collaborative culture that was established with Dr. Navarro and the school system team. And we look forward to working together again in the future for continued success uh, in recruiting and retaining high-quality employees to Charles County Public Schools. All right, thank you, EACC representatives. Now we will move on to the Charles County side. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Marvin L. Jones, who served as our chief negotiator, um, couldn't be with us today. He is on travel, um, so he will sign when he returns. But first up, we'll bring up Ms. Karen Acton. We can't do anything without our chief financial officer. So Ms. Acton will come up and sign, followed by Kevin Lowndes our deputy superintendent who makes sure we comply with all of our instructional requirements followed by HR specialist Mr. Jeremy Campbell HR specialist Mr. Kevin Howard I will also ask Chairperson Michael Lucas to come down and sign while I am signing, as well as Superintendent Dr. Maria Navarro. Okay, so I think that concludes our ceremonial signing. I cannot say it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who participated in contract negotiations. Anyone who's been at the bargaining table can tell you and attest to the fact that it is a lot of work. And sometimes, you know, conversations are quite healthy. 
uh, and intense, but we always work toward the betterment of the system. And we cannot do it without the support of our Board of Education members, and as Mr. Lucas said, our county commissioner. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your support and the hard work. Thank you, Ms. Davis. All right. Thank you very much. I know um, that was riveting for all you out there in the, in the audience. Uh, but it is uh, a, a very good example of, of the cooperation we have um, with county government and with our local unions. Um, but now we're on to some really fun stuff, recognizing um, students who've um, achieved some pretty awesome accomplishments at the state level. And we will begin. Good afternoon. Oh. Yeah. This tab. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Good afternoon, Board of, Board of Education Chairperson, Mr. Lucas, Vice Chairperson, Ms. Wilson, Board Members, Dr. Navarro, and our distinguished guest. In my best Dr. Jones voice, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the moment that you've all been waiting for. The reason why we are here and why we do what we do. We have assembled here this afternoon to acknowledge Charles County Public School students that, is, that have received recognition by the state of Maryland. <laughs> I am Kristen Modes, Content Specialist for Gifted and Differentiated Services and the Destination Imagination Southern Mar Maryland Regional Director. 43 Charles County Destination Imagination teams were among 148 teams to participate at the Maryland Destination Imagination Tournament held on Saturday, April 2nd at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Two Charles County Public School teams, the Gail Bailey Ghost Girls and T.C. Martin's Terrific Turtles earned first place at the Maryland DI tournament and took their creativity, complex problem solving, 21st century skills to the next level as they competed against teams from all over the globe during the 2022 Destination Imagination Global Finals Tournament held in Kansas City, Missouri, May 21st through May 25th. Introducing the Gail Bailey Ghost Girls is Miss Gales principal of Gail Bailey Elementary School. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor to say how proud I am of the Ghost Girls. Destination Imagination's mission is to inspire and equip youth to imagine and innovate through the creative processes. Our Yale Bailey Elementary School Ghost Girls are being recognized for earning first place at the Maryland Destination Imagination Tournament. They took their creativity. They took their creativity, complex problem solving, and agility skills to the next level at the Global Final Tournament in Kansas City. At Gail Bailey, we roar. <laughs> the creativity and innovation that they display during competitions are only the beginning for Hunter Buchanan, Maggie Donahue, and Sophia Irvine. These young ladies are creative and funny, talented and gifted. They have lots of support from our school sponsors, Mrs. Amy Tashon Hoffman, <laughs> and team managers, Alexander Golding and Marie Farley. <laughs> we at Gail Bailey are so proud of their creativity critical thinking and collaboration and girl prowess. I present to you Hunter Buchanan. <laughs> Maggie Donahue. <laughs> and 
in Sophia Irvine. Way to represent the best elementary school in Charles County. To introduce T.C. Martin's uh, Terrific Turtles is Principal Todd Wonderling. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Navarro, Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chair Wilson, and the rest of the board. Thank you for having us here today. Our DI students had to design and build a structure less than nine inches tall and less than 175 grams that rolls down a ramp and survives a collision. The students also created an eight minute skit with props and scenery that integrates the rolling structure. One of their props was a five foot tall, I'd be about this tall, just here. Uh, five foot tall tornado that rotated using gears and a bicycle chain. They researched tor tornadoes and created a solution that sent that tornado back to Texas. Once the structure enters the structure tester, weigh, uh, weight is placed on top until the structure fails or the eight minute presentation time runs out. For, this, for their efforts, they placed first in the elementary level at the state tournament and 18th at the global tournament. I would like to present to you the T.C. Martin Terrific Turtles. I really want to thank our sponsor and our team manager, our sponsor, Ms. Susan Nottingham, and our team manager, Mr. Arundo Robinson. <laughs> and without further ado, I'd like to present the team members of the 18th in the world global tournament winners, the Terrific Turtles. First, we have Reagan Heiss. Next, we have Jamal Harper. <laughs> next, we ha next, we have Sophia McDonald. <laughs> next, we have Isaiah Milo. Next is Autumn Portillo. Next is Avery Robinson. And last but definitely not least, Max Schlegel. Again, I want to thank the board for this recognition, and I want to thank my wonderful T.C. Martin students for the amazing job they did, and our team sponsor and our team manager. I don't mean to disagree on the scales, but so much, but you know what? We're not too bad either. We're one of the best <laughs> elementary schools in the county, so thank you very much. the Maryland State Advisory Council on Gifted and Talented Education recognizes outstanding gifted and talented students, educators, and community stakeholders. Six teachers and 15 students from Charles County Public Schools were recognized for their accomplishments at the 2022 Celebrating Gifted and Talented Education in Maryland Awards Ceremony that was held virtually on February 23rd. Students nominated by the learning resource teacher at their school were recognized for outstanding student accomplishment in gifted and talented education. 
Student criteria for recognition included academic performance at a high level, being a current recipient of a school system, state, or national award, and participation in a gifted education program. At this time, the principals or their designee will introduce their students recognized for out student, outstanding student accomplishment in gifted and talented education. Introducing students from Theodore G. Davis Middle School is Principal Mr. Robert Griffiths. Thank you. My name is Robert Griffiths and I'm the principal of Theodore G. Davis Middle School. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you all to Mary Elaine Belancho, current eighth grader at Davis. She plays the violin in the Davis Orchestra, loves video games, likes to crochet, enjoys roller skating, and even though she admits she's still figuring things out, she wants to be an architectural engineer or some sort of designer when she graduates from a four-year university. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Elaine Belancho. Good afternoon. I am Walanda Thinstead, principal of the Phenomenal Pickawaxon Middle School. I introduce to you our phenomenal scholars, Mr. Ethan Harris, Miss Madison Scott. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Tober. Good afternoon, I am Brenda Tillotson, proud principal of General Smallwood Middle School. I'd like to first introduce you um, to uh, eighth grader Eliza Friedell, daughter of James and Dana Friedell. Along with being an outstanding student, Eliza participates in strings. Our next student is eighth grader Donovan Smith, son of Martin and Catrice Smith. Donovan is a straight A student who participates in our AVID program. Good afternoon, my name is Erica Williams. I am the proud principal of Benjamin Stoddard Middle School. I am thrilled to congratulate Ms. Carly Newman, a phenomenal leader and scholar at Benjamin Stoddard Middle School.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvia Royster. I'm the proud vice principal at C. Paul Barnhart Elementary School. On behalf of our school building principal, Dr. Brian King, we would like to congratulate Sammy Arib. But before he comes on stage, very briefly, this young man brings so much light to our school. He is a positive encourager to anyone you meet. He keeps us laughing and smiling and shining every day. We are very proud of this scholar. Congratulations, Sammy. Good afternoon, I'm Lou D'Ambrosio, principal at Barry Elementary, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Caden States, our EGATE award winner and board recognition recipient today. He is also the fifth grade chess champ of Charles County Public Schools. <laughs> and, a, and a true renaissance man, Caden. Caden is the only student in 20 years to beat me at chess. And we, we have a rematch scheduled for tomorrow. Good afternoon. I am Michelle Beckwith, the proud principal of Dr. James Craig Elementary School, and I am honored to introduce my three students. Not only are they academically successful, but they're good little tigers with kindness, respect, and being responsible each and every day. First, Mason Seitz. Asha Sila. <laughs> Kaylin Stahl. Good afternoon, I'm Carrie Richardson, the principal of Mary H. Matula Elementary School, and I'm delighted to present Keely Pham, a fifth grade student at our school who has been with us since kindergarten. Keely, your school community is proud of you and your accomplishments. Good afternoon, I'm Deborah Brown, the principal of Mary B. Neal Elementary, and I have two students here who I'm very proud of. The first, I'd like to introduce you to Lewis Benton. He is a truly gifted student and also a very gifted human being, in my opinion. He always does his best, and he pays careful attention to detail. So, come on up. I am also proud to introduce you to Gavin Manilod. Now, Gavin is also an outstanding blue crab. He works really hard every day, and his 
One of the most exciting things that I can tell you is that he actually made a perfect score, a perfect score on his fall MCAT. So. Good afternoon. The group that you'll be hearing from next, or meeting next, are from the Fine and Performing Arts. Uh, the students you'll be seeing have received awards from the state in both at the State Theater Festival and State Honors Band and Choirs. So this year has been rather difficult, as you know. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that these students have shown the perseverance as well as the teachers to be able to get the students prepared to be able to compete at that level. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, first recognize or introduce up Mr. Uh, Doug Bolin, or Do Doug Dolan, principal of La Plata High School. <laughs> He'll be followed by Mr. Darnell Russell, principal of Maurice J. McDonough. I'm clearly representing my brother Bolin, so. Uh. <laughs> At this time, we have, uh, we have the pleasure to introduce two, uh, an all-state thespian and an all-state band, and I'm gonna have no better person than their teachers introduce them. So I'm gonna have Miss Jennifer Joyner introduce our thespian, and Miss Kate Sellers introduce our band. with great honor today that I um, acknowledge Jackson Saunders. He's been an active member of the La Plata High School Thespian since his freshman year. He entered the theater program with a boundless amount of energy that he still has to this day. Um, during that time, he also came across his true talents were really tested his sophomore year when he was a part of a class which was not quite as eager as he was to act. But he was a true leader in that sense in which he listened to his classmates. He worked with them relentlessly to make sure they knew their lines and blocking and his true leadership talents still prevailed in his senior year when he became the president of our thespian society and he helped to rebuild our theater program our numbers have increased substantially with Jackson he continues to motivate inspire and challenge his peers and even myself as a theater teacher it's Jackson's enthusiasm respect and love for theater that stokes the flame in all of us to burn much writer. So his recognition as all state thespian is well deserved and very hard earned. Um, I just want to say I'm really happy to see three marching band kids. Uh, Jackson is a marching band kid, uh, Ian is a marching band kid, and Isaiah is a marching band kid. It just makes me happy to see them succeed in whatever realm they're in. Um, so just want to throw that out there. Uh, so today uh, I have the pleasure of recognizing Isaiah DeLeonard. Uh, he's a ninth grade student at La Plata. Uh, he is being recognized today for being selected for the 2022 Maryland Junior All-State Band on Euphonium out of many other excellent students in the state. He also has this year accomplished a ton in the musical realm. Uh, he earned superiors in both the county and state solo and ensemble festivals, and he also received a superior for submitting an original band composition to the Maryland Young Composers Project. Um, at La Plata, Isaiah is a multi-instrumentalist. He plays euphonium in the symphonic band, marching baritone for the marching band, uh, drum set for the jazz band, and percussion for the pit orchestra. So he's not only talented in what he made Allstate for, he's also an amazing percussionist and drum set player. We congratulate Isaiah on his Allstate selection, as well as his many other musical accomplishments in just his first year at La Plata.
Well, good afternoon. My name is Darnell Russell. I'm the proud principal of Maurice J. McDonough High School, and I am here to recognize some of our phenomenal thespians. Well, in order to recognize them, I also thought it'd be a great opportunity for their phenomenal and fantastic teacher to join them up here uh, to introduce them. Uh, and I would like to introduce you all to Ms. Jana Howe. Thank you. Hello all. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, we had 10 amazing students earn awards at the International or the Maryland Thespian Festival this year. Um, unfortunately, only four could come, but I want to very quickly talk about the six that could not. I'm going to start with our student who earned Distinguished Thespian Award. Um, Ms. Melanie Hall was my president this year. She has been a three-time er, Maryland Thespian Superior winner and a one-time international thespian winner for her stage management projects. Um, she'll be going virtually this year to the International Thespian Festival. She's at Camp St. Charles right now as a senior, so she could not be here, but I wanted to make sure that people uh, understood her accomplishments and what she did for our troop. Um, I would also like to talk about Rebecca White, who earned two superiors at uh, the Maryland Thespian Festival, and she will be traveling with myself and her partner um, to the International Thespian Festival uh, next week, starting this Sunday, and we appreciate you all supporting that and allowing our students to go. We thank you so much for that. Um, the last thing that our students got to do uh, at the, the Maryland Thespian Festival was um, the students that, some of the students that are here, uh, they earned what are, what's known as the Allstate Thespian Award. Um, to become an Allstate Thespian, you have to have become a honor thespian, you have to have um, been a leader in your troop, uh, and so many other different things, and all of these students are officers in our troop, are my right and left hand people. They get things done around McDonough drama, and we cannot appreciate them enough. The students who could not be here are Elena Steinmetz, who is a senior, or sorry, about to be a senior, going into um, continuing to be an officer. Maddie Smoot, who is a graduating senior, Rebecca White, um, Sam Chernoff, and then we also have the four that are with us today, and I'll get to them now. Um, these young ladies all um, are Allstate Thespian Award winners at uh, the Maryland Thespian Festival. Um, we've got Skylar Belisle. Come on up, Skylar. Skylar was our secretary this year and is moving on to an office in her senior year as well. We've got Layla Holloway. <laughs> this year, Layla was our points clerk for um, our troop and is moving into, I believe, uh, treasurer next year, if that's correct. Um, our next young lady is Gabby Mashisha, a graduating senior. She was one of our treasurers this year, and she is off to get a neuroscience degree at Johns Hopkins. And last but not least, we have Miss Annie Sullivan, who not only earned her all-state thespian, but she also earned a superior and is going on to the International Thespian Festival this summer with me. I could not be prouder of them. Thank you very much for supporting us. Good afternoon. My name is Simone Young. I'm the coordinator for STEM education. It is my immense pleasure to come before you to recognize our students for excellence in STEM competition. These students are the future leaders in STEM innovation. And after the presentation, students, I hope, would you meet me outside? I have a small gift for you guys because I want you to keep creating, innovating, and problem solving over the summer. So we're ready for next year. Okay. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the two state awardees for VEX Robotics. VEX Robotics is the largest and fastest growing robotics program 
conducted globally with over 20,000 teams from 50 countries playing over 1,700 competitions worldwide. On March 12th at Newtown High School, the CPUs from John Hanson Middle School went head to head with the top teams across the state to emerge as the Maryland tournament, tournament finalists. The Lucky Duckies from Picklebacks and Middle are the awardees of the first place in engineering design. Both teams represented Maryland in the world competition held in Dallas, Texas last month and demonstrated skill, teamwork, and grace under pressure. I'd like to turn things over to Mr. Colehorse, um, principal of John Hansen, followed by Ms. Thinstead, principal at Pickle Waxen Middle School. Good afternoon, my name is Ben Colehorse. I'm the principal of John Hansen Middle School. I'm proud to present our three students as members of our VEX team. Um, we've just gotten used to them driving robots around after school hours, tinkering and practicing. Um, but really the, the heart and soul of that team comes back to their coach who really has built our program to what it is today. So to introduce his team who competed at Worlds, Mr. Dan Meltzner. Hi. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, I have my VEX team, the CPUs, uh, who went to Dallas, Texas. Uh, first, we have Mitchell Bose Cruz, eighth grader. Next is Salim Damna, sixth grader. <laughs> and we have Christopher Hill, eighth grader. So you heard about pressure, you heard about perseverance. Let me tell you about these Pico, phenomenal Pico Panthers. For seven days, our robot was in transit. Yes. And so the team that I'm about to introduce to you, not only did they build a robot in one day, I also received an email and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I want you to know that there is somebody out in Lancaster, California that said that I have been involved with VEX since 2010 and by far your students have displayed what robotics is all about. We were blessed to have been able to help them in a small way during the competition. They represented your community and your school and the VEX robotics community better than any team I have ever known. And so now I introduce to you, Mr. Jeremiah Nairn. Miss Sarah Owens. Miss Madison Scott. And Mr. Brett Wood. And in his absence, Mr. Michael Metz.
I have to say, Brett also has a really promising career in an announcer. He announces for our other competitions for Vex IQ, did a fantastic job. Or a teacher, he's got a great teacher voice. <laughs> uh, next, we'd like to talk about um, the first place awardees for our MESA competition. Charles County Public Schools is a long-standing partner of Maryland Mathematics, Engineering, and Science Achievement Program. We have the distinct honor of having the largest amount of participation in the state. On May 7th, the winners of our Mesa Regional Competition went on to represent Charles County at the state level competition, sponsored, <clears throat> pardon me, sponsored virtually by John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Today, we are recognizing the team from J.P. Ryan Elementary as the first place awardee in the category of mobile app design. The team designed an app called Stress Away to monitor and alleviate stress through exercise, mediation, me, excuse me, meditation and data tracking. Judges describe the app as thoughtful and well designed. Dr. Tyler? Oh. <laughs> I'm Bianca Valdez. I'm stepping in for Dr. Tyler today. I have had the pleasure of coaching these wonderful Mesa kids um, all school year long. They have really made me proud. Um, this year we started with a brand new Mesa team, so we did not have any other kids who've already done the app. So they have all looked at this challenge for the first time this year and came out with something incredible. And I am so proud of them. So to introduce my kids. <laughs> We have Mateo Bradford, fourth grade. <laughs> Micah Brown, fourth grade. <laughs> Kevin Mejia Trochez, fifth grade. <laughs> and finally, Madison Walton Johnson, fourth grade. <laughs> I have to have to download it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're gonna go this way. Congratulations. Thank you. for the superintendent's update to the board. Oh. My apologies. All good. good afternoon, Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, board members and staff. Um, I bring to you several important updates regarding our schools. So I want to first address the end of the school year. As of today, Charles County Public School students have one final day of school. Tomorrow we say goodbye to nearly 25,000 students, the seniors have already left us, who are likely eager to begin summer break. Um, as I reflect on the school year, I am thankful for the strong support of teachers, staff, families, and our students for their part in navigating a very challenging year. Thursday marks the last day for our teachers. I know this has been a tough year for all staff. Returning to full in-person learning was necessary for our students, no doubt. Yet with the transition and the gradual return to normalcy that we've been uh, enduring, 
Um, we also had to face challenges as students came back to schools with increased social, emotional, and behavioral issues. We also faced and continue to face workforce shortages, and all in a year when, unfortunately, nationally, schools experience increased safety concerns. During the summer months, CCPS will be providing an array of summer programs, completing several building projects, and most importantly, reviewing academic and school climate indicators to improve our practices for next year. Staff will also be participating in professional learning that will take place during the summer months and will continue through the school year. We've launched the school district's strategic plan and we will report at the start of the school year using new dashboards that will hold us accountable to continuously improve in the indicators outline, outline in the plan. While the school year started with students and staff in masks and operating under COVID-19 protocols, we are finishing strong and have much to celebrate. Part of our strong finish is centered upon recent celebrations many of us here have taken part in. Last week, under sunny skies and at times in 90 degree temperatures, Charles County Public Schools congratulated 2,045 graduating seniors who walked across the stage set up at Regency Furniture Stadium. The class of 2022 leaves the school system with an impressive net total of $167,612,845 in scholarship offers. A breakdown of these scholarships by school is displayed on the screen to the left of me. We're trying this new thing. Um, <laughs> what was equally impressive was the work of CCPS staff to coordinate these special events for graduating seniors. From staff who oversaw the live streaming of the ceremonies and directed stadium parking traffic, to those who wiped down wet seats after rain showers and guided the seniors to the start of their palm and, cir and circumstance, I am so proud of the efforts of each person who supported our graduating seniors. I also appreciate the support of the Southern Maryland Blue Crab staff, our local fire, EMS, and police officials, and anyone else who was supporting our graduates. I want to share some fun facts about our high school graduations. More than 13,500 people attended the ceremonies in person, and nearly 18,000 watched the ceremonies in air conditioning, I'm sorry, live online. <laughs> More than 6,000 bottles of water and other drinks were distributed over a period of four days, and staff went through more than 1,700 pounds of ice. I love seeing students take selfies, celebrate um, on stage with a quick dance, smile, and of course, parents and students shed a happy tear. There's nothing like the view of looking out and seeing a graduating class in their caps and gowns. We have a gallery of graduation photos linked to our website, and we also have posted aerial views of our graduates on each of the high school websites. Another important component of graduation activity is project graduation. This was my first project graduation, and it was incredible. Uh, stu more than 1,500 graduates and their guests attended the event, held over four nights at the Charles County Fairgrounds. They danced, sang, played fun games, created videos, won amazing prizes, and dined for free. I want to thank every organization, partner agency, staff member, and person who was part of Project Graduation. The list to recognize is, as lo is long, and I would hate to miss anyone or any organization. Thank you for your time, resources, and efforts to support this safe celebratory event for our graduates. For the past 36 years, Charles County Public Schools has continued our safety record of zero car accident fatalities of a graduating senior on, the graduate, on their graduating night, even though we changed the location and time. A few other staff and student accomplishments I would like to highlight include Several teams, as you just heard, competed in the 2022 Mes Mes Maryland State Mathematics, Engineering, and Science Achievement Mesa Virtual Showcase. Teams from J.P. Ryan, Mitchell, and Diggs Elementary, Henson, Pickle Waxen, and La Plata and North Point schools participated in the, in the event with J.P. Ryan, who we just celebrated, literally winning first place in the mobile app design challenge, we, which we will all purchase, what was it, next month? <laughs> We had two teams compete at the Global Destination Imagination and we congratulated them today. They are from Gail Bailey and T.C. Martin Schools. 17 members of the class of 2022 earned the State of Maryland seal by literacy. We will increase that. 
The recognition is given to students and educators who have studied and attained proficiency in two or more languages and can be used as a credential for academic and employment purposes. By the way, any student that has gotten the seal of biliteracy technically can teach that language right now as a teacher in our schools. The Maryland Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education, Maryland Green School Program, recently named St. Charles High School as its 2022 Maryland Green School. That completes the list for schools to 16 green schools in CCPS. We will increase that as well. Five students were recently named 2022 Carson Scholars. The Carson Scholar Program recognizes students for high academic achievement, humanitarian qualities, and community service. An additional 11 students were renewed as Carson Scholars this year. Carson Scholars receive a $1,000 co uh, college scholarship annually with renewal. A list of all of those students is posted in our website. Learning does not stop at the end of the school year. As I mentioned previously, we also have free summer programs in place for our students, ranging from summer enrichment and boost camps to programs we are sponsoring in partnership with the Charles County Sheriff's Office. For all the information, I urge families to please visit our website. We are also offering the Lunch on Us free summer meals program at selected locations in Charles County. Meal sites will operate from 12 to 1 p.m. Monday through Thursday, starting on June 27. Meal sites will not be open on Fridays. Any child between the ages of 2 to 18 is eligible for free hot meals regardless if they live in Charles County. A list of locations is posted on our website. I also want to highlight the partnership between the Charles County Public Library and the Charles County Department of Recreation and Parks. I urge families to look into this. This summer, families who are library users can get a rec pass for free. The rec pass allows for unlimited visits to drop-in programs and school-based community centers and pools. The Port Tobacco Recreation Center, Waldorf Senior and Recreational Center, and Elite Gymnastics and Recreation Center. Through this pilot program, the library will make 10 red passes available for checkout at library locations throughout August, through August 15th. Please visit the library website for more details. There are many family, staff, and community members. There are many ways that family, staff, and community members can stay engaged and have fun uh, this summer. In addition to programs we provide, the Charles County Department of Recreation, Parks, and Tourism has a calendar of events online featuring summer concert series, historical places to see in Charles County, coming celebrations such as the Juneteenth commemorative activities, and more. I urge the community to visit the tourism site to see all the fun things that will be happening in our community. Maybe we'll see each other in one of them. To close, I want to wish all of our families and staff and students a safe and restful summer. I look forward to seeing all students in our summer programs, on our meal sites, throughout the county, and as we prepare for the 22-23 school year. Thank you for your continued support of Charles County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. At this time, we'll have correspondence from board members. Mr. Hurd. I'm going to steal uh, Mr. Hancock's microphone today because we have a guest with us. <laughs> While it's bittersweet, it is my honor to introduce the next set of student leaders who will carry the torch of student voice. After three years in this boardroom, I am elated to introduce an entirely new perspective and slate of students who will advocate for students to this board and the newly elected board come December. First, we have uh, some CCASC officers in attendance. That's our Charles County Association of Student Councils. Uh, if you are here, please stand up and give us a wave. I don't. <laughs> so first, we have CCASC President Vernon Stover. Uh, we have CCASC Vice President Kyla Jones. CCASC Second Vice President Kendall Potter. CCASC Secretary, who's here, Brianna Albritton. <laughs> and finally, CCASC Charity Coordinator, Jordan Davis. I, I have faith in these student leaders, and I hope that they're not strangers 
to you all. Now it is one of my greatest honors to introduce the next student member of the board, the 28th student member of the board, Amira Abujama, who will take office uh, later this month. Welcome and, unofficially, officially employees. <laughs> <laughs> and serving alongside her will be a committee of student liaisons who represent the high schools. And those students are from Lackey, Tiwa Dapo Adeyemo, uh, La Plata, TJ Taylor, McDonough, Aaron Mares, <laughs> North Point, Cannon Reynolds, St. Charles, Leslie Johnson, <laughs> Thomas Stone, Chris, Christian Kopvis, <laughs> and finally, Westlake, Janasia Thomas. <laughs> Three years ago, I started as a student liaison, so I'm hoping in a couple of years, one of them, if not multiple of them, will also be sitting on this dais someday. And uh, today is my last regular board meeting as student member of the Board of Education, so I ask everyone to indulge me for a little bit longer than I usually rant uh, for board correspondence. This is my third year in the boardroom, having served first as La Plata student liaison and then being elected for two consecutive terms as student member on the Charles County Board of Education to serve our 27,000 students. When I ran, I promised a drastic change in the way the student voice interfaces with the board. I believe I have delivered. When I entered office, the student member had no vote. The student member delivered their report after our unions, not amongst their fellow board members. And during COVID, the student member was the first to be seated off of the dais when there wasn't room. After my first and sometimes tumultuous uh, term with this board, we successfully passed student member voting rights in Annapolis. I want to thank Dr. Navarro and the board for their good faith implementation of this legislation and the journey that we've been able to have together as a result. Thanks to this legislation, Amira and every student member that follows her will enjoy the rights and privileges all board members have in her effort to represent her fellow students in the policy making of the Board of Education. I want to quote my inaugural board report two years ago. I said, as student board member, I believe that the burden is on me, not the students I serve to be heard. Throughout the course of this year, I will take on and develop strategies that bolster student outreach and target students who haven't previously been involved in their education system. I hope I have served with the commitment I promised. Throughout the course of my second year as student member, I have visited an unprecedented total of 15 middle and high schools combined engaging directly with our students. In addition, I have made it a point to dedicate the bulk of my time this year attending sporting, extracurricular, and academic events that showcase the students who call this county home and the reason why this is the best school district in, Char in the state of Maryland. Uh, this has fa by far been my greatest privilege and has always reinforced my faith in our student body to educate and advocate for themselves and their peers. This past year, I was also proud to help facilitate the change in our election rules for student member of the board. Amira is the first student member of the board to be elected by all middle and high school students. I know the institution of student voice will be stronger for years to come because of this. I also want to thank Danny Mears, who served as McDonough's student liaison, Eric Valentine, who served as alternate student board member, and La Plata's student liaison, Tane Kidd, who served two terms alongside me as the CCASC president, and Tolu Dapo Adeimo, who served as chief of staff and first vice president for the Maryland Association of Student Councils. They have always been my sounding board, my support, and whenever I have felt like something wasn't achievable or attainable, they've always been the first to jump in line and, and push the status quo and say, we need to do what's right, not what's expected. Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I am blessed for us to have been able to have served together, and when I question 
what a group of thoughtful, committed citizens looks like. I will always look to them first. Finally, I want to thank my fellow board members for their mentorship. There have been many months, this one included, that it has felt I have seen my fellow board members more than even my own family. <laughs> for three years, I have been able to grow and learn amongst above all good people. While we may have debated, agreed, compromised, and sometimes even disagreed on policy throughout my years on the board, we have always put aside any personalities of discussion to focus on the policies and issues themselves. I will take the lessons of civility I have learned through my experiences here with me to the University of South Carolina, uh, where I will study political science uh, in the fall. Lastly, I want to wish my successor, Amira Abujama, the best of luck in her service, and I know the fresh perspective and spirit she brings will do well for the students of Charles County. 26 student members have preceded me, and I am confident that the best student member yet is succeeding me. Thank you. All right, who's going to follow that? <laughs> Anyone have any other comments? Miss Battle Lockhart. All right. Is it afternoon? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you all heard, we had an opportunity to attend graduations, which is my favorite time of the year, except for this year. <laughs> Only because of the weather. You know, I love the kids. So I'm so proud of each and every last one of our graduates um, that walked across the stage, especially my girls that um, transition out of my organization. I'm so proud of each and every last one of those. I really enjoyed um, the award ceremonies that I was able to attend. Um, but what I did want to talk about is the retired ceremony. That was beautiful in so many different ways. And I purposely wanted to mention this publicly because um, I don't think we recorded it, but um, it was a very emotional process for me to see my daughter has gone on a 15, she's 15, and we've been in this school system for her entire life, and I saw some of her elementary uh, teachers, principals, middle school, <laughs> and then just the eye-opening um, to see 47 years leaving us, see 44 years leaving us. 30 something years leaving us and so on and so on and so so many years that has been invested in this county by teachers staff members um it was just amazing and this is the second one for myself um before we had the same thing i believe we had a 50 year <laughs> a couple of years ago and i just want the public to understand as much as we hear your cry about teachers and staff members. Um, there's people that's been here for 50, 47 years pouring into each and every one of these kids in the school system, and that speaks volumes. But what speaks volumes the most is it's time for them to transition out. They've given all that they can give, and now we have to find <laughs> the same quality <laughs> which I know is totally impossible <laughs> to replace them because they've been around for a long time and that was a different type of teaching. And I just want you guys to take a step back to really reflect on these people that are leaving us. Some of them were in the room today handing out awards and it would just make my heart melt to know that some of them poured into my daughter and I just see so many people you know, complaining about so many different things that we hear <laughs> about what teachers don't do or what the school system doesn't do. But those people that were retiring last week, they did it. They committed. Now I'm so proud that they get to do the things they want to do for themselves because they've done a lot for CCPS. And I just want to publicly thank every last one of them that are deciding on themselves this time. Because, and I'm so grateful because we've had a hard time through COVID. And I'm grateful 
that they are still here with us. There's some that's not here with us anymore. And I want to acknowledge those families because their families committed, but unfortunately, they had to um, succumb COVID. But I just, I always want the public to understand it's some hardworking people in this school system. So don't discount just because of what you see and what you hear and your frustrations. We all were frustrated through this journey. None of us asked for this journey, but there's a lot of people. That's why I love to go visit the schools. I want to see it for myself. I don't want nobody to tell me, and I want to hear for myself how your journey is. If it's hard, if it's great, because we don't get to hear all the good stuff. I want to hear all the stuff. And it's been a pleasure to just walk in the building and staff members feel comfortable enough to share good, bad, or indifferent about their walk and know that I'm here to support them in any way I can. So I just want to say thank you for all you all have done. And I have a few more months to go with you all. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to do the same thing in the new year. The other thing that I wanted to address too, because you guys hear me a lot talk about partnerships with nonprofits. I do want to not acknowledge, even through COVID, we had a few nonprofits that people have come to me to talk about that have blessed their kids and have done some great things that even teachers have brought forth. And I just want to acknowledge those organizations that are helping and pouring into our kids when maybe we can't do everything in the school system, but they've chosen to step up like um, Beyond the Classroom, Lisa Ambers, or her P butterfly group. And those girls love Ms. Ambers. <laughs> and then um, Stella's girls, Caprice James, has been doing some really great mentoring with her girls, pouring into other young people, helping them as well. And last but not least, I was so overjoyed to just read a good, <laughs> good thing about Charles County Public Schools on social media. Um, the Commissioner Barksdale is the commissioner of the Southern Maryland Flag Football League. And he decided this year to get them some really cool uh, rings like they do for Super Bowl. And one of the teachers told, uh, post, sent him a letter to tell him how much impact it made on one of her students. Said so he smiles, but I've never seen him smile like this before. And to see that our organizations are making an impact, impact on our students in our schools. It's just that extra thing that helps us be able to serve them a little bit better. And then he had a chance to have lunch with them yesterday. So I just wanted you guys to know there's some great organizations willing to support us on this journey as we lose retirees <laughs> and find people to replace them. So thank you for all you all have done. I can't stress enough how appreciative I am as a parent, how appreciative I am as a leader, and I can't say enough about, you know, looking forward to these last few months. I'm sitting in this seat with you all to see how Miss Navarro, thank you. I know it's been a journey for your first year. I did want to speak on that. You know, to start in the midst of a pandemic, to adopt <laughs> and take over some of the challenges. But I will say I'm so proud to see um, your plan, but I'm looking forward to the impact and the results of your plan. Um, nothing happens overnight, but the efforts that I see that you have put forth thus far, it seems very sincere. And I pray that God will open doors and bring opportunities that we can re get some staff and teachers here that can continue to help you soar for Charles County Public Schools. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Padalakar. Anyone else? Nothing, Ms. Brown? I did have an opportunity to attend Summers uh, Middle School's spring concert, and it's, it always warms my heart to see standing room only with people supporting their kids. So I'd like to encourage all the parents that, that come out to some of those programs that the kids are having because it means a lot to them. 
and all of our schools should be standing room only when the kids are doing something. I also attended the CSM graduation, and I always like to go to those things because somehow I'm going to run into one of my old students, and I just love seeing when they do well. Um, I attended McDonough's CTE uh, at Ste uh, Steedham's CTE graduation at McDonough with some of my uh, co fellow work co-workers here, and um, it was a joy to attend PPW Community Day because it was so many people there, so many people there to offer their services. I was just amazed at how many people showed up, and I thought it was going to rain, but it didn't rain, it just a little bit. So that was really nice. And the retirement ceremony, like Ms. Lockhart said, they have put their time in. Of course, I hope to help them put some more time in with the retired school personnel. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's been a pleasure to work with Ian. I'm sure that there's some time in the future, I'm gonna get a call from Ian to come and help him campaign in South Carolina. <laughs> And I will get in my car and be there, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Any other comments? Can I just have a, <clears throat> have a couple? Um, so, Mr. Hurd, you know, during all the awards night, Mr. Hurd received an award from uh, none other than uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen. And, um, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to present that to him, and um, it was well-deserved, so just want to recognize you for that, and that was for just really community service, and uh, very much well-deserved. And uh, congratulations to all the other um, seniors on their awards this year. Uh, I, I also attended a concert at Stone, and uh, echo what Ms. Brown says, uh, you know, go see your kids, you know, they, they practice hard to make that happen, so. Please do that. Um, I also um, had the privilege of going to the Community Wellness Day at uh, Dr. Mudd Elementary School, and what a great event that was. And uh, I won't go into too many details, but it's that, that is the blueprint in action. Mudd is one of our community schools, and just the number of people out there um, that uh, Folks could visit to see what kind of services are available and, um, you know, food and activities for the kids. It was very well attended and some commissioners attended as well. So um, I just want to thank everyone that made that happen. That was a very good event. And we talked a lot about graduation. And uh, I echo all the comments that, um, that the superintendent said about project graduation. Um, but also want to talk about graduation and the over 2,000 high school seniors that graduated. And um, I really, like my other board members, I feel fortunate um, to be able to confer diplomas and, you know, and, and put them in the graduate's hand. Um, I got to give a diploma uh, to my niece, who was a salutatorian at Thomas Stone, uh, and that was a good time. And uh, and then project graduation, um, again, everyone that, that made that happen, um, I've been going to project graduation probably for over 20 years. I used to work it, and it's been going on for 36 years, and I was able to go every night. Dr. Navarro was there every night, and uh, I'm just going to read a few things here. Um, the Charles County Volunteer Fire and EMS Associations donated this year's gift bags and the local behavioral health authority donated car phone chargers and fidget spinners, I saw those, fidget spinner spins, pins, um, that featured the crisis help hotline. Uh, additionally, each night a total of 45 gift baskets and electronics were raffled off to graduates. The gift baskets were provided by staff from each of our schools and the electronics were purchased using funds provided from community partners. And while we're talking about community partners, I just want to thank everyone who assisted um, with, uh, with making Project Graduation happen. Um, Ms. Conti was there um, and a host of other people. If I name them all, I'm going to miss somebody. So uh, 
just thank you all for the work you did. It's very much appreciated. And um, without your work, that doesn't happen. And there we go. Look at that, just like the script says. To my left on the screen is a list of those who helped make Project Graduation a huge success. Now, and at each um, Project Graduation event, uh, 40 to 60% of the graduating seniors attended uh, from each high school each night. And overall, 54% of, um, of all the seniors that graduated attended Project Graduation. And that attendance level remains at pre-COVID levels, um, and the students um, had a really good time, as Dr. Navarro said. And uh, I just want to publicly thank all the businesses that made that happen, because they donate a lot of stuff, and, and they do it so our kids are having a, a fun and safe place to, uh, to enjoy their graduation. So I just want to say thank you, and thank you again to our staff for making that happen. And somewhere out there, there's a video of me dancing. <laughs> big air quotes, very big air quotes dancing. So, um, so thank you very much. And we are on to the next part, which is going to be update from Mr. Heil from the EACC. Chair Lucas, Vice Chair Wilson, Board of Education, Dr. Navarro, and community members. I'd like to start my comments by saying that I'm a proud educator of Charles County, and I remain proud of how the Board of Education listened to EACC member concerns and tried to address those concerns throughout the pandemic for everyone's safety. Today, however, I'm here to ask you for your help in addressing the issue of safety in our schools. Staff feeling safe has a direct correlation on how students feel at school, and without ensuring safety, we know that learning will strive for, that we strive for is impacted. It does sadden me that once again I'm before this board to address the concerns of safety. I do not believe that anyone in this room wants unsafe schools, but we continue to go further and further down that road. We are all aware of the list of incidents, from biting and hitting, spitting and throwing furniture, physical altercations that either staff or students were injured, and the list goes on. What impact does this have on a student who witnesses these types of incidents? As we lay the groundwork for a new school year, I'm calling on system leaders and the Board of Education to take decisive action through collaboration with EACC to ensure that we are examining our processes and taking the necessary steps to restore a safe and orderly climate to Charles County Public Schools. The discipline matrix is designed to address behavior incrementally with notable exceptions to jump up for those higher level of accountability. I'm here to tell all of you that staff are losing confidence and in some cases have already lost confidence in the discipline matrix being effective at curbing extreme behaviors. I'm here to tell you that staff do not feel the discipline matrix is being used with fidelity. This is one of the continuing factors to staff feeling unsafe in their workplace. If a student does not receive an impactful intervention or appropriate consequence as needed because of the decisions they have made, they have no reason to stop that behavior. But that's only part of the problem. What happens to the other students? In one of the worst case scenarios, they see that aggressive behavior is appropriate and something that they should consider when they are frustrated. There's another concern, though, that the, the student will become afraid. Afraid of coming to school, afraid of going to class, and afraid that if we can't keep staff safe, how will we keep students safe? There's also another area of concern, and that is communication. Staff are concerned about going home and seeing on social media posts from the sheriff's office and community members regarding the continued incidents that are taking place in our school that they are unaware of while they're working in these same schools. This lack of awareness of staff, the lack of communication, is damaging the trust that staff have in getting relevant information in those extreme cases. The escalation in the number and severity of incidents this year continues to have a cost. It continues to have a cost on staff, it continues to have a cost on students. EACC knows the concerns we see in the schools are often a reflection of problems that our students are experiencing outside of school and in our community. We continue to advocate for the safety of all employees, but something must change. EACC looks forward to being included in the discussions and the solutions we must implement to restore confidence and trust that our schools are safe places to work and learn. Together with the superintendent, 
the Board of Education, and the community, we must find reasonable solutions to this crisis we are currently in, and one, quite frankly, we cannot afford to return to in the fall. It is all ho our hope that we are all willing to do what is necessary to address this situation. Our educators and the students they serve are counting on us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heil. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Birch from AFSCME. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Birch, president of AFSCME Local 2981. Our local held our monthly meeting on June 7th. Our membership's activities were to nominate the executive board, ratify the 2023 contract, and elect the executive board. This activity was done live. Changes to the contract were tuition reimbursement was increased to $3,000. All support staff will receive one level and a 5% COLA. None of our sister counties can compare to Charles County. Our 2023 contract was ratified unanimously. I didn't realize that gas prices, food costs, Almost everything needed to survive would skyrocket. Ask me local 2981 must get to work early this year for the 2024 contract. I was elected president, Stephanie Lawson as vice president, Tracy Newbold as treasurer, and Mono Di Medetto as secretary. Local 2981 must express the need for extra caution in and around our schools. All students are under our watch by bus drivers, building service workers, secretaries, food and nutrition workers, instructional assistants, everyone connected with Charles County Public Schools. We must keep our students safe. Students are our future. 2,100 seniors graduated in 2022. May each one of them find their place and be happy. Be safe this summer. See you in August. Oh, wait, it's not too late. Vaccinate. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Lowndes. So I'm actually going to kick start this uh, presentation. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about the next two presentations that we're doing jointly. Um, we have a cross-functional team here from Human Resources and the Office of Curriculum and Instruction that will be presenting on um, uh, large bodies of work. Um, the first one is uh, discussing the Maryland LEADS grant. It was the largest grant that came out from the Department of Education this year um, for large reform initiatives statewide. And so we come to the board to talk about the areas of emphasis that staff brings forward um, and what we're going to hone in. I hope that the board can see alignment in our strategic plan with the areas that we have um, gone after and have been um, awarded funding to improve a lot of our processes. Uh, as Ms. Battle Lockhart talked about, um, the 
retirement ceremony and our endeavors to hire um, staff to Charles County Public Schools, you'll hear quite a bit about that body of work reflected in the Maryland LEADS grant. And then the other um, presentation that is coming forward to you today is a discussion about the bodies of work that we are actually, um, you know, we're saying goodbye to this uh, academic year, but um, staff will be very, very busy this summer working on reflecting on our practice, working jointly with our community on issues that we need to improve on. And one of them is obviously the teaching and learning in our classrooms. And so I hope that um, you will also hear how school teams, including classroom teachers, who are now part of our how we define school leadership teams moving forward, are going to come in and are going to be part of cycles of learning. And you'll hear quite a bit, um, and I hope um, you'll hear as a part of our language that we talk about uh, creating cycles of learning where we get to visit each other's work um, uh, with the mindset of jointly improving the practices, the teaching and learning practices. You'll hear things like safe practice and uh, staff will be learning what that is and how that in its purpose allows for teachers and for staff members to be able to do their work and try things out with their students in their classrooms that overall improves the learning experience for students. So I am actually very excited for these two presentations to be coming forward. That's not a pressure point for you guys to be riveting. Um, but I do think that in the core of the work of the learning experience that kids are going to have moving forward, uh, these are going to be fundamental, with, whether it is supporting our recruitment, our retention, our development of uh, teachers and staff, to also supporting structures that allow us to go visit each other and learn from each other. Um, and make sure that schools are not um, siloed, a bunch of siloed classrooms, that we're actually all learning together. So with that, I'll pass it to Mr. Lowndes and Ms. Majors to do the first presentation. Right. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Uh, Chairperson Lucas, uh, Vice Chairperson Wilson, board members, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. You know, when I walked in this afternoon, I was excited when I saw the crowd. I thought everyone came to watch our presentations. <laughs> 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 but, but we have a great presentation, so <laughs> let me go on here. Uh, so the, the Maryland LEADS grant, as Dr. Navarro mentioned, this is a, uh, one of the largest funding uh, grants given by the state of Maryland this year, and I'm very happy to say that we received over $7 million. The grant was designed with the uh, in purpose of having school systems be intentional in certain areas. So it was a, uh, unlike in the past when uh, the Maryland State Department of Education had school systems apply for grants. This one was you applied for specific areas and you had to be very targeted on certain areas. And one was the recovery of academic success for our students uh, after COVID. Um, another one was the recruitment and uh, retention of teachers that many school systems, all school systems across Maryland are having a difficult time not only finding teachers, but uh, training and keeping the teachers that we have. So uh, the purpose of the grant was really targeted towards those areas. Um, if we can go, so uh, Charles County, we put together a team. We had multiple teams uh, right towards these three areas, the science of reading, staff support and retention, and growing your own staff. I worked with uh, Ms. Majors and we spearheaded a group. And, uh, this is part of the, the group of folks that were helping us write this grant um, and were very successful in getting the money uh, that we applied for. Um, so the first one, I want to talk a little bit about when we applied for the grant, we wanted to make sure that we were aligning to the board's goals, we were aligning to the superintendent's strategic plan, and we were aligning to the work that was already underway within Charles County Public Schools. The last thing we wanted to do was take away from any one of these areas. So we were very intentional when we wrote the grant. And so when you look at and you hear about these three areas, you're going to hear about a link to the blueprint, to the strategic plan, and to the, to the board's goals. So the science of reading, for example, one of the goals is to increase student achievement um, and to make sure that all of our students are receiving great in, uh, instructional materials, great instruction, and our staff is receiving high quality professional learning. And you're going to hear about all of those when you hear from Ms. Huddle today talk about the science of reading and how we're going to spend that money. 
you're going to hear from Ms. Majors about the next two uh, areas that we are, excuse me, focusing in on staff support and retention and grow your own, uh, where, as we all know, we're uh, searching every day for high quality employees, but we have quite a few folks that are coming to us that really have the heart and desire that you talked about, Ms. Betta Lockhart, uh, but they don't have the credentials yet. And so we understand that, you know, as long as people really want to work with our students, we can work with them and help them become great teachers. And so we have a plan in place to do just that. Go, and the last one is Grow Your Own. And this is where we have some of our IAs, our instructional assistants that are, are with us. Um, and they don't quite have the credentials to become a teacher yet, but they want to become a teacher. And we have other folks in other areas within the school system that are, might be interested in becoming a teacher as well. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at helping and supporting folks that want to become a teacher, get the education that they need, and the support during that process. Because one of the things that uh, Ms. Majors and her team has done a great job is, is, is find out why people uh, have left us and we targeted those areas you're going to hear from Ms. Majors during this grant to be able to support and keep the people that we have. I'd like to turn it over now to, to Ms. Huddler and uh, have her speak a little bit about the science of reading. Sure. So, which was different than the other strategies, we had to focus on all three focus areas. So we had to look at who we were going to contract to train teachers, who we were going to, what kinds of um, quality materials we were going to use, and then how we're gonna progress monitor our students to make sure everybody's reading by grade three, and what we were gonna do if they weren't. So this is what we decided to do. With we decided to contract to provide training for all of our pre-K to second grade teachers right now over the next two years in letters training. And that's the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. And that is a really in-depth training for teachers on how students learn to read, why they have difficulties reading, and what we can do to help them. It is not a reading program that you take and you put into the classroom. It is a lot of theory. It's a lot of making sure that teachers understand what's going on in kids' brains that help them to learn to read. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to train the reading specialists so they can further, once the grant is gone, we can continue the work that the letters training is doing. So we are not done right after the grant ends. We're gonna continue with that work. And they're gonna become trainer of trainers, and that's how, we're gonna, that's how we're gonna train teachers past second grade. We know that we ha are gonna have a problem getting substitutes, and so we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew, really. We didn't wanna say we're going to train all these people in two years, but we're gonna space it out and we are gonna continue to train them after the grant is done. Also, we're going to infuse a lot of decodable texts in our classrooms from K to two. A decodable text, let's say in phonics, you're learning about short A. A decodable text has text, has words in it that have a lot of short A words so the students can apply what they're learning in those phonics lessons into their reading. We're also looking for a lot of that content rich material, social studies and science texts that will build their background knowledge when they learn about social studies and science. And then for our last area, we're gonna continue, we're gonna create a system for progress monitoring, which means we're gonna make sure that what we're doing is working and if it's not working, we're gonna change it. We have a system in place for that. What we need to strengthen, and this is what we put into the grant, is time to sit and analyze that data. What are we gonna do with, what kind of instructional implications are we gonna have? What, what are we gonna do going forward? And we're gonna use that data and come up with plans for our students that aren't being successful. All right, so let's talk about um, why we chose to target the programs that we did. As Mr. 
Lowndes indicated we were intentional in looking to secure financial support um, for staff support and retention as well as grow your own. Um, the school system desires to be in the very best position it can to continue to attract high quality talent and retain them so that we can deliver to society the next generation of citizens such as Mr. Ian Hurd. Um, and first and foremost, what we need to focus on is reducing teacher turnover. And when we get a little bit further into the um, presentation, you'll see a slide that shares information about our uh, turnover rate. And reducing teacher turnover is essential. And I think Mr. Um, Heil does a great job every month of bringing to the board a glimpse of what life is like for our teachers in the classroom. And I will read to you an email that I received yesterday from a math teacher who's decided to resign. She said, I plan to leave the teaching profession entirely and I'm looking to acquire a government job. Many things played a factor in my resignation, but the tipping point for me has been student behavior and parent control. Society has turned schools from a safe space to a very dangerous one. And that's, you know, it's heart-wrenching when you get emails like that every day of high-quality professionals that could have remained with us for 30 and 40 years, but they're leaving for many of the reasons that Mr. Um, Heil has cited when he's come before the board on a monthly basis. So improving the support um, that we wrap around our teachers in terms of orienting them and onboarding them, training and developing them, and ensuring that when they come to work every day, they feel valued and appreciated, and they feel like they're contributing something to the school system. Providing them with the mentoring, the quality of mentoring program, and experiences that would help ensure that their practice of, is of the highest quality, making sure they have all the training and support that they need, as well as uh, securing the financial support for teachers who are um, preparing to advance their education, advance their skill sets, um, those who are seeking professional licensure, making sure there are no financial barriers to doing so. We've actually partnered with um, Bowie State University um, with a summer intensive program that they're offering to help our conditionally licensed teacher on the road to professional licensure and becoming um, fully certified where they can take coursework during the summer when they're off and get 12 to 15 credits um, and get that coursework out of the way because one of the uh, most significant things we've heard during the school year is the overwhelming expectations when it comes to balancing the workload. So it's a lot for a conditional teacher when they come and they teach, you know, seven and a half hours in the classroom every day and then also have to pursue classwork and get themselves ready for tests. So anything that we can do to wrap that support around our teachers, that is why we decided to focus on staff support and retention. And of course, growing your own. We do not have a large influx of uh, talent coming out of high schools going into undergraduate teacher education programs. We've heard that in the past. It continues to be our reality today. We know that historically Maryland has imported most of the teachers that come into our state uh, to work. So in order to ease the staffing shortage, we have to look at programs where we can grow our own, starting with our high school students and getting them um, interested and acquainted with possibly coming into the educational field. Um, we had a good time talking with students when we were at graduation and they were lined up ready to go across the stage, you know, sharing with them to remember to come back to Charles County. So, and not everybody's going off to college, some are going directly into the workforce will consider us as an employer. And maybe when you graduate from college, sometimes plans don't always work out, we will take you back in a heartbeat. <laughs> we would love to have people who know us, who understand our values, um, who are like family and familiar with us to come back and work for us. So improving that teacher pipeline uh, is one of the goals of targeting growing your own staff. But also we have um, made significant strides in the last couple of years with increasing representation from uh, a demographic standpoint in terms of ethnicity of our educator workforce. And so growing your own programs would help us with that initiative. 
Um, again, creating uh, opportunities and programming where we can remove any kind of financial barrier to helping uh, an instructional assistant, a paraeducator, on the pathway to becoming a teacher or a high school student who may want to go into the field. Those are the kinds of initiatives we're looking to build and use some of that funding for. It is a work in progress. We need the support of the community at large, internal and external, in order to make these programs successful. Um, so with that, I will ask, thank you, to turn to the next slide where you can actually look at our teacher retention data. So Mrs. Miller was very helpful in going to the state and pulling data on what retention looks like across Maryland over the last 10 years. And so that line in the middle that is red is the median. So half are above, half are below. The numbers highlighted in green is Charles County. So you will see that our teacher retention rate has fluctuated um, over the last 10 years. If you look at 2020, it was the second highest in the last 10 years. I think it was the second highest. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay, so we've basically fallen in the bottom 25% for the last almost 10 years, nine years. COVID helped us out, so our retention rate was a little bit higher, but we're back down to 84.6%. So we, we have struggled, is my point, when it comes to teacher retention, and we need to do a better job. And so um, the superintendent having us focus on things like culture and climate will help us in a significant way as we move forward with some of the initiatives that we're going to introduce. So with that, I will turn it over to Mrs. Miller. Hello, good afternoon. So as Mr. Lowndes and Mrs. Majors were um, talking about the different strategies that we selected, uh, one of them that we thought was very important was staff support and retention. And within this strategy are various focus areas that we get to select what we focus on um, when it comes to implementing this grant. One of the things that we were very careful with, we wanted to make sure that what we do with this money is sustainable, that we create, we're changing practices to really address what our data is telling us. So we, um, these are the choices. We could pick one or we could pick all of them, but again, we were very selective in what we were doing because we wanted to be purposeful and we wanted to plan for sustainability. So we could launch initiatives to support positive organization and uh, culture and climate, develop co-teaching and or mentorship programs, redesigning professional development models to increase job embedded coaching and implementation. We can design induction, uh, redesign induction uh, experiences for our early <coughs> career teachers and um, we could also select launching a cohort model to support our teachers in obtaining national board certification. So before we could make those decisions about what we were really gonna focus on, we need to just look at what does our data tell us? What story do we have? What is our story here in Charles County? So we, we dove, we looked into what our teacher retention was. We saw that we have about 1,800 teachers and of those 1,800 teachers, 273 of them are conditional, that's 15%. 417 of those 1,806 teachers are in their first three years. So that's 23% of our teaching staff. We also have, I know that we've talked, I've talked to you before um, about our instructional assistants that are going to be required to either have their associate's degree or their child uh, development associate per the, the blueprint, our pre-K instructional assistants. And we also looked at where our largest need was. Um, we know that that is in special ed, math, and science. So we looked at what the data said, but then we wanted to see what does the research tell us about teacher retention? Why are teachers leaving? And we also, um, as Mr. Lowndes stated before, Ms. Majors and her office has done a really great job of collecting that data to, to find out why our teachers are leaving. 
So we know that lack of compensation is something that contributes, and we're hoping that the blueprint will help with that. Um, because beginning July 1st, in 2020, by 2026, the uh, beginning teacher salary will have to be $60,000. We also have to see that 10% increase, salary increase, beginning um, on July 1st of 2024. So again, we're hoping that the blueprint is helping us to address that lack of compensation that we're seeing. Ineffective teacher preparedness. So we know that the data tells us that 25% of teachers that are in alternative prep programs, so 25% of our conditional teachers are more likely to leave the profession. And we do know, again, from looking at also our research, our um, data aligns to what national research says about dissatisfaction with working conditions, including lack of support from administration, lack of job uh, professional development, and access to supplies and technology. So with that being said, thank you, Renee. What we're doing to address what our story is telling us, because we want to improve the story, that we are all very vested in this. So we are looking at changing that professional learning um, and how it's job embedded in the day and learning from each other, building capacity from within and having the opportunity for our teachers and our leadership teams to um, visit other classrooms to see uh, what is working and what is not working. We're looking at changing our mentorship program right now. Um, we currently have mostly retired teachers that come back and support our new teachers as teacher mentors, but unfortunately, we don't have enough teacher mentors to support all of the new teachers that we have. And the research is also clear about what teacher mentorship should look like. It should be a colleague that is full-time working in a school building, that is teaching something similar, that looks like you, that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about this idea of equity versus equality. We have to start giving our staff what it is they need. That is equity, right? So uh, we're looking at professional learning plans based on um, what the teachers really need, because what one teacher may need at one school may not be the same thing that they need at another school. So we need to be very conscious of that as we collect this data from our various stakeholders. We're looking at that national board certification cohort model, because as we've talked before, uh, teachers in the classroom that are nationally board certified beginning July 1st of this year receive an additional $10,000 salary increase. It's not a stipend, it is a salary increase, so that goes towards retirement as well. And we're also looking at, um, we've been uh, working with special ed about an instructional assistant academy, um, because we know that we have to provide support not just to our teachers, but to our support staff as well. We, they are critical, our instructional assistants, they are critical to the teaching and learning process here in Charles County. We recognize that and we know that we have to invest in their capacity as well. So that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Howard. All right, good afternoon, board members. Um, so when you look at Grow Your Own, you're gonna see a little bit of an overlap between obviously um, staff retention and Grow Your Own because they kind of go hand in hand to make sure that we're providing our staff what they need and then we wanna make sure that we're growing the staff that we currently have. Because if you look at the first slide, there are three uh, sources of what we call human capital that we can try to capture within Charles County Public Schools. So we're looking at our, our current teaching assistants, whether that be our instructional assistants and special ed, non-special ed, and I always like to even add that to any non-certificated staff member in Charles County Public Schools, whether you're a building service worker, whether you're a food service worker, People have a variety of different backgrounds. Doesn't mean that they can't become a teacher. So we like to change that to any non-certificated staff member who is currently working in Charles County Public Schools. The other is what can we do with our current students to provide them support as they transition out into college down at South Carolina, even though you're gonna study political science. <laughs> and maybe we can offer scholarships for some of our TAM students to be able to come back and then guarantee them a job upon graduation to provide them support while they're in college, but then guarantee them employment with Charles County Public Schools upon graduation. 
And then the other, even though those folks aren't currently with us, we have to continue to create pipelines for outside folks who are non-educators to get into the field. So for example, I look at you, Mr. Lucas, I know what you do uh, in the private sector or public sector in that sense, but what folks who have those skill sets who can bring them to the school system and then we can set them up with the proper training so they can become educators within our district. So in order to do that, some of the things that we want to do is we want to look at compensating our non-certificated staff who are actually <coughs> engaging in uh, teacher prep programs because uh, currently when someone has to do their internship, they would have to take a leave of absence during that time. So we are penalizing an employee who's wanting to become a teacher. Uh, so we want to be able to compensate, compensate that staff member while they're currently doing their student teaching and replace them maybe with an instructional, uh, temporary instructional assistant. We also want to begin to provide direct billing for our non-certificated staff. Currently, we don't do that here in Charles County. We want to make sure that we have a cohort of folks who want to become educators, uh, like Ms. Majors was indicating earlier, to alleviate that financial burden. So that way, uh, the employee then can register for a class, uh, they take the class, uh, they send in the pre-approval forms, class comes back, grade comes back, we cover the bill. There's no out-of-pocket expense for tuition for said employee. We also want to provide the direct billing also for, uh, like Ms. Um, Miller was indicating before, we're going to have the academy for the, those instructional assistants who have to get their associates and or the CDA. Uh, again, why should those employees be burdened with that cost up front? we can provide that direct bill option for them so that they can easily access that program. Uh, we talked about offering the TAM student scholarships. Uh, and then the last part is, I think Mr. Lowndes is going to expound on a little bit later, also maybe in a different presentation, but teacher leadership training uh, using uh, MSDE and West Ed rubrics to provide leadership within our system to continue to grow, not only just in the teacher rank, but what else are we doing as far as administratively. Any questions? Ms. Wilson? So great presentation, really love this uh, proposal that you're bringing to us. Um, could you go back to the slide that talks about working conditions, in particular supplies and technology? Could you elaborate um, some of the challenges within I mean, it's, if we're getting, what, $7 million, uh, what portion of that $7 million is going to go to um, supplies and technology? Because that seems like a really an easy fix with or without this grant. So that is national trend data. That doesn't necessarily include data here. The, um, for our, that was national data for that. And I think that we have really addressed a lot of the technology barriers that we have. I mean, I hate to say, you know, it was a positive thing that came out of COVID, but we do have the one-to-one -one computers for our students now that we didn't have before that. And, you know, I know back in the day when I was in the classroom, <laughs> you know, my computer was this big on my desk and I couldn't take it home. Um, so I, I don't know that, um, I don't know that that pertains to us per se at this point. And I also know that you know the technology department has done a good job of, of making sure that everyone has the technology they need and has really encouraged schools that if you're something that you do need that you don't have, please contact us. Because the ESSER money has really helped us with as, as, uh, to, to not only go to one to one, but we, there was money set aside for a new learning management system that I know is coming out soon and other uh, improvements within the technology field. And I would also say the same with uh, any instructional materials. If you, if, you know, we, we bought quite a bit of instructional materials um, using the ESSER money. Um, and this is another opportunity that schools are gonna get with the uh, letters training, but it comes with materials. And so we bought new curriculum. I, I came to you earlier this year and talked about the new reading curriculum, the new math curriculum. And so any school out there, any uh, teacher out there that, that really does feel they don't have what they need to teach and be effective, I would highly encourage them to contact me or my office and we'll, we'll work with them. Because we do have the, the materials. There's no reason why that should be a reason for someone to leave Charles County Public Schools. And, and then you mentioned uh, administration support. I'm, I'm sure that that's part of professional development as well. Um, um, but I want to address, and I think 
Mrs. Majors can understand this has been a long journey for me in talking about the teacher pi yes. pipeline from sitting in the back yes. of the room as a representative of the NAACP and now as a school board member. Um, and, and I applaud, um, I, I mean, you know I love you guys immensely, but you know, the two elephants in the room is one, the pipeline issue. I, I fully support trying to grow our own. Um, but it, I think one of the things that, topics that has to be brought in this discussion is the D word, and that is discipline. It, you know, we can throw $7 million, and you guys have a wonderful, wonderful plan. But, but let's face it, I mean, I admire teachers immensely. I would love to teach. I'm inspired by you guys. But I have to tell you, classroom management and the, the deep discussions that we need to have about that, it, it somehow has to be, if we're going to throw or spend the $7 million wisely, we need to talk about discipline and we need to talk about the P word, and that's parents' involvement. Because I'm watching you guys bust your butts, and that those two important components has to be part of that of this very important discussion. Um, and as far as the pipeline, I mentioned Mrs. Majors. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember having a discussion with the previous state superintendent about, hey, can we have a conversation uh, with our universities and colleges in the state? of Maryland about, you know, um, creating an atmosphere more conducive to making teaching inviting. So I'd like to try that again. We have a new progressive <coughs> state superintendent. I don't know what types of discussions that superintendents across the state, we're all having the same problems, um, but we, we need some heavy hitters to deal with this pipeline issues. I'm absolutely convinced that Charles County Public Schools has a plan and you, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but there are other components of this that, quite frankly, we, we need more, more impactful you know, ideas, you know, to con you know, not to confront our state superintendent, but to have a deep discussion with him to say, look at the university systems. Um, we, I'm not attacking any professors out there, but some of these professors have not been in the classroom since Pippi was a pup. <laughs> <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be an advocate for you because I see the hard work. Um, and I, I've only been involved for eight years We're talking about educators being in for decades. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just feel like we, we, we need to get some legislators on board with this. I went on a recruiting trip, and there were only four, there were only four prospective seniors in a graduating class, where it, at years ago, there were literally hundreds. And so, yes, I'm on board with this, but I think we need to have a deeper discussion about discipline because I think there are a lot of people that want to get in the classroom and teach. I know they do, but we got to have that have that conversation, a deep one. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Kyle has texted me and asked me. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas, if I can yes. just queue up a couple of things. I, it is important to think about the broader context of the board. We have the president of MAVE sitting here as part of the board. And I think uh, a couple of just quick things that I would put out there. The Maryland LEADS grant puts out funding a lot on this area of grow your own retention, recruitment. There are a set of partners that I think are very, very strong nationally that are doing work in other states that are grow your own kind of exemplars, and those are now working in Maryland, so that's moving the, the needle. 
In terms of legislation, I think um, the board should continue to think about progressive legislation moving forward that addresses the workforce shortage issues and the ability of uh, people in other fields coming back into education. The blueprint clearly addresses the salary component of it. We will all get to that salary because it's required law, and guess what? We will start competing against each other to opt that salary. All good things from a salary perspective if you're just looking at the salary components. But I would also say that um, looking at where I am now, I think there's a, a, a conversation to be had with higher ed institutions and the community college uh, realm and place for community colleges in locations like Southern Maryland where we don't have a lot of higher ed institution representations in large numbers and think about how to give the flexibility to community colleges in the field of education to expand to provide a full sequence of an undergraduate degree. And that allows us more buying power to be able to start with our youth who 60% um, of them somehow do go through CSM at one point or another and align programs like the very first early college program that we're gonna start this fall with 72, 74 students, I can't remember what the number is, uh, and 74. 74, thank you. And we can be, and as we grow this program, we intensify teaching as one of the ones that we program, and we sell it to families as an economically viable, you, you come out with a degree with two years of college having been paid by the school system, you can finish locally and then you can also work locally. So we've gotta, we gotta string the ties together to put this puzzle, but I absolutely believe that as the chairperson and the vice chairperson meet with the state board of education and talk, um, and the board members at large talk to um, the um, our legislators and so forth, we need to keep pushing and continuing to push ideas and options that allow us more flexibility locally to do so. The LEADS grant allow us to, to start this process, but there's more connecting of the dots that either we will do locally, because we can, like I said, in terms of as we expand things like early college and hone in on options, but if we're able to expand early college and the local and CSM is able to have a full um, degree program at any point or we get a partner here that can do a full degree program uh, locally um, it will it will definitely um, help us quite a bit Ms. Battle-Lockwork I just wanted to um, comment on something Ms. Wilson stated um, as we move into this dual enrollment world um, we as educators myself get an opportunity now to get in the classroom. So I think the dual enrollment process is helping um, adjunct professors and professors get the opportunity to get into the classroom to really see what school is like now. So I will say that um, to your point, that's happening. Unfortunately, it has to happen more. But as it relates to um, students becoming interested and becoming teacher and, and going into education um, we have a lot of work to do <laughs> um, nationally to make it look more attractive in the classroom as we talk about discipline kids see that going on in the classroom they're not interested in being a part of that process so um, as you state about discipline it's, it, it goes back to parental and at home as well. So it go, I'm always gonna go back to, if they don't have the resources in the community, which goes back to our county government that was here earlier, um, to be able to provide resources to those um, parents in the community to have the resources to support their, school, or their students that come to Charles County Public Schools, we're always gonna have that challenge because the expectation will always be for us to fix the discipline problem. We can align ourselves all we want to, we've been there before, but because of COVID and so many other things, it's just heightened the behaviors of students, it's heightened things that's going on in the home. Um, as we spoke earlier, now um, 
we have students that rely on school and tomorrow's the last day of school and this is their safe haven so then there's a whole nother thing so holistically as we've always talked about we need to work collaboratively with other agencies to support with this discipline piece we can't do this by ourselves so um, again got great presentation um, at least amazing uh, guide for us to follow <laughs> you know unfortunately as I stated earlier it's not going to happen overnight but we have to have a plan and a roadmap to get us there and thank you for your efforts Mr. Herb thank you and thank you for the presentation I think we've had good discussion on this um, so I just wanted to circle back I think Miss Wilson raised a really good point about teachers feeling the need for support for resources in their classroom and I appreciate your response Mr. Lowndes about you know if teachers want additional things they can reach out to you but I think we need a more systemic solution than expecting teachers to reach out to our deputy superintendent when they need something and I know with my own teachers if there's one thing teachers complain to me about it's the fact that when they buy tissues it comes out of their own money and someone can correct me but I'm almost certain that right now teachers are not allowed to use their classroom funds for certain materials like tissues so we're, we're tying their hands and it comes out of their own money so we're, we're nickel and diming our teachers on all these resources and then simultaneously you know uh, giving them these these raises and these perks but I think it comes down to our foundation of how are we appreciating our teachers and so I I just hope that we have when, when we're continuing these discussions and from a high level we're looking at resources to purchase and implement I hope we're also supporting our teachers in their own discretion to support their classrooms how they see fit with their teaching styles and the needs they perceive from their students because TC Martin isn't always going to learn or need the same resources that JP Ryan is or Mount Hope Nanjamoy and uh, in addition to that the other thing I wanted to circle back to uh, was we had we saw the trends with how we rank compared to other counties and so I, I appreciate the magnitude that the blueprint is going to provide us but as Ms. Wilson said, it's a competition and we're competing against these other school districts. They're getting these statewide resources too. So my, my first question is what makes them different? If we look at you know, the top retention, what are their teachers seeing that ours aren't? And then on top of that, how do we change the trend in our school district? So those are my two questions. So those are great questions and those are questions that we're trying to answer <laughs> to try to figure out you know one of the reasons why uh, Ms. Majors and her folks are asking folks why they're leaving is to determine exactly that why is it they're leaving and how can we target what we're doing in order to keep them um, and so we're going to continue to work on that because if we, I think if we all knew and had the answer right now we'd be doing it today and we'd be able to keep everyone that we currently have and so we're, we're going to it's something that we're going to have to constantly work on and constantly improve on and making sure that we have a great a place where everyone wants to come and everyone wants to work and once they're here they feel supported and they want to continue to work here but to Ian's big question you know uh, doing some um, intelligence where we're having conversations with the 24 other LEAs to um, look at those who are modeling uh, initiatives in such a way that they are able to retain their staff at higher rates um, is warranted. Um, we do have some roundtable groups where we have the opportunity to come together with counterparts um, from other uh, school districts and can share ideas, um, can get, seek recommendations, and we were actually able to do that even through the Maryland Leads application process. There was required ideas sharing um, and there are just some um, LEAs who are already out of the gate with improved um, evaluation structures such as Baltimore City Public Schools um, and Montgomery County Public Schools there are other LEAs who are you know already out of the gate with grow your own programs um, so we are hopeful that our work in progress 
um, with regard to these initiatives will push us um, in those upper uh, quartiles uh, with regard to retention within the next three to five years. So we hope to see the fruits of our labor. And can I just add one quick thing? I, I don't want to beat a dead horse on this, but some of the counties have infrastructural, higher education, geographically close options so that, you know, when I worked in my previous district, which is much higher in the, in the totem pole, it is easy for me to link three or four higher ed institutions and put out an early college program, which Charles County didn't have, make the connections and get cohorts of kids to be taking algebra by first, uh, by eighth, not first grade. Eighth grade. <laughs> Hold on. Eighth grade. <laughs> by eighth grade and get a whole bunch of flexibility in the high school and I can create pipelines. And so what I'm saying is that, again, we still have a lot of lobbying to do to geographically be able to position higher ed institutions in a way that I can work with them and create those streams of pipeline as well. And I think it's very doable here. I think there is so many more um, there's a lot of pluses here in terms of quality of living and uh, and I know, I know, affordability to an extent, but quality of living that in other places is just not the case and, and, and people are trying to find those. So we've got an, a great opportunity to make some matching happen and we got to be strong advocates for Southern Maryland to be represented, to be innovative, and I don't just mean in Charles County, but throughout. And I do want to work with my counterparts in, in St. Mary's and Calvert to create the dynamic and the pressure to get some uh, fluidity in terms of opportunities here that allow us to create these grow your own and pipelines of people that are local that um, we can build the capacity of. And I just want to point out, Charles County lost some students, but not as many as so many other places throughout the county. So when the new results of where people are moving to, you know, this is still a growing county. And so there is a lot of opportunities here and it's, it, it's a very interesting time. I, I know it's hard and I know it's, it's, it's daunting, but, but we are also positioned to be in a, in a really great place right now compared to other places throughout the county. So I'm actually very optimistic on just pulling some strings, getting some things started, and then really being able to link some things that we, that we started. Thank you. Ms. Brown. One thing, this is a great presentation, but one thing that everybody always seems to shy away from is parents' responsibility. <laughs> Teachers go to school to learn how to teach, and that's what they want to do. They are not behavior specialists. They want to teach. All they want to do is come into their classroom and teach in peace. When I talk to teachers, I've got little kids that run around and wreak havoc. It's a parent's responsibility to have your child prepared for school. That way the teacher can easily teach them. But somehow we've got to get back to a conversation about parent responsibility. Everything comes up and it's on the school. We gotta feed them, we gotta do this, and give them medicine, whatever. It's the school's responsibility. Someday we're gonna run out of a way to provide all those responsibilities. But somehow we have gotta get to that conversation about parental responsibility without getting slapped on the hand. Whoops, don't, don't blame the parent. But I was lucky, I taught when I could teach. I would like to have every other teacher have those good days in the classroom where they are able to teach. And that's a simple solution. Let's get back to teaching these parents how to be parents and prepare their kids for school. I'm sorry if that sounds negative, but <laughs> that's what I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would disagree with you. Any other comments? 
Uh, we gotta get moving, but okay. real quick. Uh, I forgot, I also wanted to go back. This was earlier in our presentation, but I know there was a community concern uh, that we received about, let me pull the, the terminology. It had to do with our interventions and we talked about supporting K through five. And so I just wanted to express that there was community concern about children getting left behind if they don't get on the boat by K through five and what sorts of uh, LLI and interventions will we have for our secondary students. But I just wanted to put it on the record that that was a concern. Okay, thank you, Dan. Ms. McGraw. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think that the three areas, the focus areas that uh, have been chosen are really gonna help us to accomplish all the goals on our strategic plan. I wanna talk about reading because <laughs> I'm really happy and thrilled to see um, uh, you know, the three bullet areas there. Um, most importantly, the, the last one about creating a system for um, regular progress monitoring and analyzing data. I just, my, my concern is that we're not going to put too much of a burden on teachers to be able to give us the data that we need to be able to analyze on a consistent basis, because you know what we're going to hear, that they can't get their, <laughs> they can't teach reading because they're doing too much assessing. So have you, do you have any thoughts about how we're going to accomplish? Sure. Well, the data that we use right now is iReady. So for, for a couple, I mean, we use a couple of assessments, but that's one of them um, that we can look at and analyze. That's given three times a year. We also, in our early childhood grades, sorry, my kid, in our early grades, we give <coughs> cadence, and that's part of the Ready to Read Act. The only students that we need to follow up, they are, everybody is screened one time. The only students that we need to continue to screen are those that fall below. And we picked a cadence because it is a quick one minute per measure test. So it averages about four minutes a child. So it's very quick and it's not everyone. It's only targeted to our students that are struggling. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna come up with those supplemental instruction and see if that's working and use those, use those data data dives, data analysis, to see if they're working. If not, we're gonna change what we're doing. So I don't feel like it's going to take a long time. We've also proposed a couple of changes to assessment in three to five, because I'm hearing that it just takes a very long time, and we don't have that time to, we don't have that time to spend. We have a sense of urgency right now where we need to be teaching, and not just constantly assessing. Thank you. Did I answer? We have some questions from the students. So the, the part with the programs is more about how we're going to provide support for those students currently in those programs, whether it be TAM or like Educator Rising. How can we make sure that we're providing either financial support for those who want to enter the uh, profession of education? And then are there other creative ways that we can try to make sure that we target the students that are currently within our school system that want to maybe get into education? So it's not necessarily creating a new program such as TAM. And how can we support from the central office perspective and human resources provide that support for those folks who want to become educators or encourage more folks to become educators. As far as, you mean when someone who's interested in teaching sees a lot of discipline issues and so therefore they don't want to go into teaching? Is that what you're? So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in for Mr. Lowndes here. So he, he, he kind of skirted that before. Uh, there's a lot of rules that school systems have to follow, right? And, and we talked about the discipline matrix. Someone brought that up. And uh, 
our, our legislators in Annapolis and our folks at the state, um, Maryland State Department of Education, um, they, they, uh, I won't go as far as to tell us, they strongly encourage us to, uh, to do things a certain way when it comes to discipline. And, and we and other school systems have pushed back on that. Um, but at the end, you have to follow the rules that have been laid in place for you. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't answer your question, but um, as Ms. Brown said, um, you know, if kids come to school ready to learn, which goes back to the parent, uh, then a lot of those things go away. Thank you. Sure, thank you. All right, real quick, because we're real behind. So go ahead. Um, what we did, they all had to um, submit their proposals to MSDE. And then what we got was a list of contract providers that we could choose from. And we chose Lexia. And what they'll do is they will provide our, um, they will provide people that will come in and train our teachers. So one of the things that the, the grant made, uh, everyone that wanted to work with the school system had to submit also a proposal to be part of a partner with school systems and they had to show that they've had proven success rates. And so when we go on and try to look at all the people that we could choose to partner up with some of these initiatives, we've known that all of them have, have proven that they've had success rate in whatever it is that they're, they're trying to help school systems with. All right, you got another presentation to go through? So the second presentation is really about uh, a, a continuation of the LEADS grant and the work that's being done with our schools to improve student achievement. Um, these guys, I know they all want to leave, but you, can, you have to stay. <laughs> I felt it here in my, my right arm. Like. And you have four wingmen right there. <laughs> so just to let you know, things changed the way we thought we were going to do the other one first and then this one second, so they thought they were off the hook. <laughs> um, so really it's about um, distributive leadership model, and if we go to the next slide, which is a shared leadership model for uh, schools and focusing on school improvement, which focuses in on student achievement and how do we improve student achievement. And it's really how do we get our school leadership teams trained and working together where there's buy-in and there's also a voice from everyone within a building. And so we are working with our school leadership teams and Dr. Navarro will talk about June 23rd and 24th will be the first time we're bringing these teams together. And represented on those teams will be teachers, will be administrators, will be ILT members, and they'll all be coming together with the intent of focusing in on the data on their schools and what does that student achievement look like and then where are areas that they need to improve. Um, and the idea is really to get folks to understand that, you know, this, the achievement in a school doesn't rest on any one person or any one area. So the principal doesn't own all the student achievement, the teachers don't own all the student achievement, the uh, IRTs don't own all of the uh, professional learning within a building that it's actually a shared leadership and so the training will be focused in on how to get these school teams to work together to identify areas that need to improve to identify areas that they are going to focus on in improving and I think someone here talked about you know giving our teachers some voice and some uh, say in what goes on in this building and this is really what this, this is focused in on and it's also looking at the supports that we offer schools and making sure that we're aligned with this work that's gonna take place within the building. And it's really part of Dr. Navarro's strategic initiative of professional learning and how do we tr uh, really build up our staff so that everyone feels like they're part of the system and they're part of working on improving student achievement across the board. 
Um, and so we're gonna be looking and working with a, a, a group, uh, an outside group, that's gonna help us really focus in and make us look at what are we currently doing and how are we currently aligned both upstairs in the offices of uh, curriculum and uh, administrative administration and also in the schools and then looking at the school uh, teams and looking at the school improvement plans and how we're gonna work together for schools to focus in on a, uh, a plan that really fits the school, their school needs, their student needs and comes up with strategies that will help and support their efforts. So if we can, so it's really, a, a, it's a, a, a continuous improvement cycle um, and it, it's never ending. And it starts with the school team. It starts by looking at uh, the root cause analysis of, uh, analysis of the school data. And we were gonna be bringing school teams in here and really walking them through their own data at their own schools and walking them through the root cause analysis process. So they all have an understanding of what it looks like. The teachers, the uh, administrators, and the ILT members. Mm -hmm. And then those schools be asked to select an instructional uh, area that they want to focus in on at the school. And then they're gonna look at, from a central office uh, perspective, how can we support these schools in whatever instructional area they're trying to, look, uh, trying to improve upon and they're gonna focus in on. And so it really is, each school will have an opportunity to determine what is best for their kids and then what does it look like and then come up with a professional learning model that they're gonna institute within their own buildings with the support of central office staff. There's three phases to this. Number one is there's an overall uh, countywide uh, design team. This was uh, started already where we came together with members of uh, principals, well, the unions, Dr. Navarro led it, uh, it was, uh, myself and all the other uh, chiefs of schools coming together and we're looking and coming together and deciding what is currently our model and structures that we have in place and how do we tweak them and make them work to so align the work that's going to take place by supporting the schools and having the schools in this distributive leadership model work for them. We need to develop tools. We're in the process now of making sure that there are processes and tools and uh, alignment in order to help and support the schools within this work. And then there's gonna be implementation of that work. And that's gonna be taking place over the next couple of years. It is a continuous process where we're all, we'll be working on what we are doing and how we're helping and supporting schools and looking, helping and supporting school leadership teams and teachers. And it's an always ever improving process where you're looking at what you're doing, is it effective, is it not effective, what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be improved. And then really the bottom, and the, the bottom line and the goal is looking at the student achievement and making sure that our student achievement improves. But it really does focus everybody in on helping all students achieve in all of our buildings within our schools and aligning everyone's work within the system and within the schools to focus in on school achievement. And so there's gonna be three different teams. Like I said, there's a district team, there's a school team, and there's a coaching staff team. The coaching staff team works with the school teams. So you have the Office of School Administration work with the instructional content staff. And we have to work very closely together to make sure that we're supporting our schools in a way that the schools feel like they're supported and that it's not a top-down approach. Once again, this is all lined up with the work that's going on with the blueprint, the work that's going on with the LEADS grant, and it's all aligned to the strategic plan that Dr. Navarro has laid for us. The only thing I just want to add very quickly, and I know we're running late, is this is going to feel like a major disruptor at first because schools right now are working independently on their own uh, sometimes with obvious collaboration from central office that comes in and looks at each school individually. The concept here is that it disrupts individuality of schools working in silos by themselves and brings us all together to see each other's practices. In a time where there's not a lot of substitutes and we've, hit, we've taken an academic and, and wellness hit because of COVID, this is... The, the right time to get out there and do what research says it, it does best, which is 
to have people leave their classrooms and go observe other teaching for people to be in classrooms observing teaching at all times and so this is going to feel like a disruptor in some ways for how we do business but it is a more inclusive uh, overview of teaching the people that teach every day need to be able to observe other people teaching and need to be part of those leadership groups. So in many ways, it conceptually sounds like we're doing something in practicality. It's going to very much feel like we're doing something very, very different. But it is the best practices for us to actually get out there and look at each other's practices and have, again, classroom teachers be part of the leadership decisions of fo honing in and focusing on, on what we're doing. Because everything that happens in, in schools is because of a collective decision by the adults to focus in on certain practices. And we have lots of research that says that once that happens in a school, the student academic indicators go up. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to giving you some updates and expect next year to ask you to join us as we go look at classrooms, as we, you, we debrief and teams get a chance to debrief, that you're there so that you can hear what this experience is like for our staff. Thanks, Dr. Navarro. Any other questions from board members? Ms. Sorry. Ms. McGraw, no, it's all good. <laughs> yes, yeah, Ms. McGraw, please. So I heard you say um, that there was going to be an outside group. What is their role? What's that? You said something about, and maybe I was in La La Land, I'm sorry. So we're working with a, a consulting targeted leadership, and they, they are coming and they're helping us. They have worked with many districts across the country okay. that have done this work and that have been very successful. And one of the things that they have shared, um, it, 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 uh, some research on is why this has been successful and there's a really a couple of reasons why it, it has been successful they have found out is first of all there's bond, when you're including everybody in the decision making process there's buy-in as to what the schools are doing they don't feel like central office is telling what to do it they feel like they've had a voice in how they're going to look at instruction together and focus on instruction and focus on student achievement and then pick an instructional strategy that they feel is best that will work for their school. And so, you know, not all schools will have pick the same instructional strategy. One school might pick to focus in on writing, uh, writing, a, you know, across the grades and they'll, they'll really study writing as to how it needs to be implemented uh, effectively in first grade and second grade and third grade and then they'll focus in on providing the professional learning opportunities for those teachers and they'll be giving it to each other because they're the ones who have picked that instructional area and so uh, school systems that have stuck with this because it does take a while and that has been effectively implemented have really found that they have been able to keep their staff their staff is happy morale is up because they feel like they've had a voice in what's going on in their buildings so will the consulting firm be with us throughout the course of a number of years, or is it just a, an initial? Well, uh, we're hoping to say for a couple of years. Right now, we have them for, for one year. Um, but we are, once again, uh, we're looking at the LEADS grant to help us with uh, that financial piece. Uh, we wrote into the LEADS grant that we are going to be working with an outside group uh, to help us support this initiative. And so uh, that's the intent going forward. The other thing that, that has been effective is that in, in people don't understand it in the beginning, but you know when you get schools to focus in on one instructional area that everyone agrees across the school that that's what they're going to focus in on, it does raise student achievement for all students. Um, and it's not the only thing they're going to do, and that's sometimes the, the misunderstanding. We still have curriculum trainings that we have to provide. And, you know, Kim is still going to be providing letter trainings for her first and second year teachers, but, but they'll also then be focusing in on whatever it is that their individual school has chosen based on the root cause analysis to really hone in on as a school uh, to make sure that all of their students are getting across the grade levels. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Miss Acton, you ready to go? We have Mr. Schwartz on deck. Apologies, Mr. Andrus. So jo joining me today for the three presentations is Sherry Fisher Davis, our budget manager, and Carol Kohler, our accounting manager. Um, all of these documents should also be on board docs for you. Um, we're going to start with Carol on the daily and hourly wage rate increase. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, so we're presenting a few items for your approval today. Uh, the first is the FY23 daily hourly wage rates um, that we have up on the screen and you have in board docs. Uh, we increased the minimum wage from, well, we adopted the increase in the minimum wage from 12.50 to 13.25, and it's reflected in these new rates. In addition, the substitute rates have been changed from a daily rate to an hourly rate with a guaranteed minimum of four hours a day. Um, that substitute rate uh, change reflects about a 16% increase over this year's rates for substitutes. Um, and it was a strong push to go for an hourly rate rather than the half day daily rates that we've had in the past. Um, to compensate for these increases, the operating budget's been increased by 500000 to cover the minimum wage adjustments and lap salaries will be used to cover the projected budget shortfall of 2.6 million for subs. And uh, we respectfully request the board approves the 23 daily and hourly rates. And any questions? Ms. Abel. Yes, but I don't remember the code law right now. I was getting ready to pull it out, but it was a little too quick here. Um, there is a law that we have to pay a certain hour, an annual wage up to a certain point, or they have to be hourly. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do, does this not fall in that because they're substitutes, or um, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Let me see. Are you asking Ms. Abel about the whether they have to get um, time? Um, uh, Time off, sick, yes. sick leave, sick leave, and so forth. So if they work a certain number of hours, this came out a couple of years ago, and they go up to a certain number of hours, then the employer, us, would have to give them sick leave. Is that what you mean? Um, you can go on to somebody else if okay. you want to while I look it up. So there I, were I'll ask a question. So on, I'm looking at the, the new proposed salaries. So... Um, are these then, would these be the only salaries in the system that are still less than, than $15 an hour? No. Okay. Um, there are contracted food and nutrition um, folks that are, are still below that. Okay. Thank so you. The, these yeah. um, rates here are, um, you know, the substitute rates that we're using. They're not our full-time staff. So... Um, we're working to raise all the rates, as you know, but right. there was a strong push by um, Ms. Ms. Louise Evans saying that, she, you know, she needs to raise the substitute rates um, to try to attract substitutes. We're having such a hard time getting them. She actually had proposed higher rates than this, believe it or not, um, but, you know, we, we took them down um, to, to try to make it a little more reasonable for our budgets. And she was adamant that um, we needed, she felt like we should change it from a daily rate to an hourly rate within, with the guarantee of the four hours. Um, so this is her proposal. This is what she thinks she needs to be able to provide more substitutes. Okay. Ms. Abel. If 
found it. Okay. And actually, it doesn't really pertain to this, but it's the proposed um, overtime rule that they're expected to pass soon, and it's if they make the annual salary is less than 47476 they should be paid hourly instead. This is from the Fair Labor Standards Act. It was put forth by the Obama administration and then put on hold by Trump, but now Biden's going to be passing it again soon. Okay, so well, it's, it's expected. Yeah. Yeah. Expected, expected to be passing yeah. it again soon. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Definitely. Yeah, so if someone makes under that annual salary, then they should be put on hourly. Hourly instead. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. April. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so next, Ms. Fisher Davis is going to talk about our um, tuition rate increases that we're proposing. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Charles County Public Schools annually sets tuition rates for admitted students who are not residents of Charles County. Typically, there are three sources of payments, parents of students who want their children to attend our school system, out-of-county school systems, and out-of-state agencies for foster care uh, for students placed within our system. For FY23, the in-state tuition rate will be $9,720, which is an increase of 8.2% from the prior year. The out-of-state tuition rate will be $14,790. For students requiring special support services, such as um, under IDEA or 504s, there is a direct service schedule. Um, so we are asking that these rates be approved uh, for FY23 so that they're in place by July 1. Are there any questions? Okay. And just for the public, we, we, we typically see this every year, yes. correct? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions from board members? No? Okay, very good. All right. Last but not least, um, we, are, we are presenting for discussion and hopefully approval our FY 2023 budget. And it's very little changed from what we discussed at the last um, work session that we had. There was a $5,000 uh, lowering by the state when we got their numbers. It's still possible that we could get different uh, state numbers, but hopefully not. Um, so this is, is virtually the same budget that you've seen, which is a budget of $439,014,077, which is a 7.6% increase. We have 12 million additional dollars from the county and um, 19 million additional dollars from the state. And no changes to, yep. to what we had, had um, said that we could fund in our previous meeting. Understood. Any questions from board members? As Ms. Acton said, it's the same thing we've seen before. Yep. All right. We and made we'll, up some time for you. Thank you. And <laughs> we'll, we'll, we're going to vote on this uh, an action item tonight. Thank you. Mr. Thank Schwartz. you. Uh, the board is uh, here to uh, receive another report item on the uh, athletic eligibility requirements, uh, policy 6431. The board has had uh, extensive dis uh, discussion about this in previous meetings. Uh, the superintendent has presented her final recommendation to the board uh, on board docs, and if you have any questions, uh, we can certainly address them. Otherwise, uh, the board can certainly consider this for moving forward. Okay, um, Dr. Navarro, would you like to just talk to this a little bit? Sure, so I appreciate the feedback from board members um, and I've been able to get additional feedback. I modified, I'm bringing forward a modified proposal from the last time I came to the board with um, a proposal from staff. And in this proposal, the two basic premises is a shift um, to the current eligibility policy that would have two main areas, uh, the ability of um, 
freshmen, ninth graders, excuse me, ninth grade students to be uh, automatically eligible um, for a semester rather than a first quarter. And then the second request is the consideration of uh, changing the GPA requirement for eligibility from a 2.25 to a 2.0. Um, and that's what I am bringing forward as my amended recommendation to the board. I think it's worth noting that um, even with these proposed changes, uh, if you just take a quick review of what we were presented for, a bit before rather, um, this obviously opens the aperture a little bit to allow more students, but we would s still be um, the strictest county in the state with regard to um, students having to meet criteria to participate in extracurricular activity. That's correct. So Mr. Schwartz, this is in front of us. Um, what do we do need to do at this point? Uh, we need further direction from the board as to whether this is in uh, proper form to move forward as an action item at a future meeting. Okay. So at this time, uh, Chair will entertain a motion to accept uh, eligibility policy eligibility policy 6431 um, as presented. Are you, at this point, you just we're, we're just looking for a motion to accept it. That's a motion from Mr. Hurd. No. Okay. No. I. Okay. No. So no motion to accept. Okay. So. Mr. Uh, Lucas. Ms. Abel. I was under the impression that this had to come forward at the next meeting unless it was voted on to be an emergency action item. That, that is correct. That's correct. At this point, this is a report item. Uh, we're looking for the board's consensus that this, that this is what the board wants to move forward as an action item at the future meeting. Uh, if the board wants to uh, take other action, the board would need to have a motion. So I'm just trying to establish whether we want to move this forward uh, as an action item at a later meeting. If, uh, if that wasn't clear. Or as an emergency action item tonight. Either way. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see a motion. So uh, thanks, Mr. Schwartz. This will come back at the June 27th work session as an action item. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Looking for Mr. Andrus. Mr. Heim? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have the project status update. Just like to highlight uh, a few things. This is the start of a busy summer for the folks in planning, construction, maintenance, and operations. We have several large projects that are going to set to begin here within uh, the next several days. We have the McDonough Limited Renovation and Addition that will begin, and that will be a three-year project. We also have the beginning of the McDonough Field Turf installation, finally. We have also set to begin once we have students and staff out of T.C. Martin at the end of this week will be getting the renovation and addition at T.C. Martin uh, over the next two years where T.C. Martin students and staff will be relocated to the transition school. So we'll have all the movement of all those resources and materials from T.C. Martin to the transition school and thus we'll also be having the staff and students at Brown moving out of the transition school uh, this week to move back into Brown as the end of the open space and closure project uh, is set. I will also have a couple other projects which will be getting a kindergarten edition at J.P. Ryan and a kindergarten edition at Malcolm which will begin here in the next couple of weeks and will go on uh, with completion set for next summer. 
And then we also, uh, last major project we have set to begin this summer is the John Hansen roof replacement, which will occur over the next two summers. So I would just like to briefly thank uh, April Murphy and her staff and building services. They get set for a busy summer of getting schools ready for uh, already. We're in that process of thinking ahead for the beginning of next school year. And they're very busy during the summertime cleaning and getting schools ready for the start of the next school year. Maintenance staff will be very busy this summer with various maintenance projects and they take advantage of schools uh, being somewhat vacant uh, during the summertime to catch up on some work orders. Uh, I'd also like to thank transportation staff and Mr. Snow with his leadership and uh, we've had some bumps and bruises this school year with, with transportation but uh, and you know they, they've worked through those issues so we continue to provide a quality service to the students. And then uh, lastly, uh, Steve Andrews and his staff uh, as I mentioned, these projects, uh, they'll be very busy this summer and uh, the next couple years with various projects. Uh, so we're appreciative of the support we've been receiving from the county and the state uh, to make sure that our buildings are the best facilities we can, we can have. So I would entertain any questions at this time. Okay. Thank you all. At this time, is there any unfinished business? Mr. Lucas. Ms. Abel. I would just like to request that since we haven't had a break, we go on break until recognition and finish this afterwards. I don't, we have like literally a minute unless someone says anything. I'd like to keep going if we could because the recognition starts at 430. something specific you wanted to discuss later or no I would yeah. just like a break okay. <laughs> I, got it. Okay, I mean there's no we've got if there's no unfinished business we'll be we'll be done in in one minute unless someone needs anything else is there any new business before the board okay and any future agenda items all right even less than a minute okay so now we can take a break and uh, we'll come back at 4 30. Thanks. Good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. It is that time in uh, our program where we're going to honor a few folks. And first up, I'm going to call on Mr. Heil from the EACC. Thank you, Chair Lucas. Uh, first up, we have the Ruth Ann Hall Award. And I want to go back to, since he's not here today, the spirit of Dr. Jones. But this is why we do it, right? I mean, there's a lot of things we talk about that's very serious in here. But this is just an awesome award. And I'm getting a little bit of the, the fluttery because I get to present this. Uh, the Ruth Ann Hall Championship Scholar Award was established by the Education Association of Charles County, EACC, as a memorial to Miss Ruth Ann Hall, a past president of the EACC. Ms. Hall was an English language arts teacher in Charles County Public Schools for over 20 years and was a passionate advocate for children and public education. She was a recipient of the Agnes Myers Washington Post Teacher of the Year Award. Ms. Hall was a dedicated educator and was respected and loved by her students. In her memory, we've established this award for middle school students since her last assignment was at Mattawoman Middle School. While serving as president of EACC, Ms. Hall became the first president to be full-time released in Charles County. Ruth Ann developed leukemia and fought a brave and long battle with the disease, and she passed away in 1999. In her memory is a tribute to the love of her students and her tireless efforts as an advocate for both teachers and students. The EACC created the Ruth Ann Hall Championship Student Recognition. Students are nominated by their teachers and selected by a committee to receive this award. The committee selects winners based on the dedication to schoolwork, improvement, positive attitude towards learning. This award recognizes those students who have worked hard despite facing difficulties and have persevered to become champions in their own right and therefore worthy of recognition. I like that one note. It's kind of like, and I, I'm stealing words from a colleague at this point, they've kind of rallied through amazing determination and sheer grit and have persevered and proven themselves to be champions in this crazy post-COVID everyone is struggling atmosphere. These are the types of students who teach us how to teach us how to move forward. If I could have the principals from 
Summers, Hansen, Pickleaxen, Davis, and Smallwood, please, to help present the awards. Come on over here. Well, there you go. Um, we're going to do a picture of it. Okay. Who's Corey? You're Corey. Okay, she's starting. You weren't this side. <laughs> this is you. You were there. Okay, who is Heather? Okay. And Eunice? And, yep. Okay, so without any further ado, <coughs> This year's winners of the Ruth Ann Hall Championship Scholar Award. From Smallwood, Corey Brown. <laughs> From Davis, Adiosola Abubia. From Pickleaxen, Heaven Reeves. <laughs> From John Hansen, Eunice Alcantara Cruz. <laughs> From Milton Summers, Catherine Wiley. Also from Milton Summers, Stephen Washington Sharp. Congratulations, everyone.
All right, take it away. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairperson Lucas, board members, Superintendent Navarro, friends and family. We are here to recognize the outstanding contributions and accomplishments of several of our staff members for the 2021-2022 school year. These individuals are being recognized for the following. Maryland Teacher of the Year finalist for Charles County Public Schools, Outstanding Vice Principal of the Year, and Outstanding Non-Certificated Staff of the Year. Each of the recipients will receive a $1,000 cash award for being selected, as well as either a resolution or plaque as an acknowledgement of their outstanding service to Charles County Public Schools. We will begin our evening with the introduction of Ms. Morgan Hungerford, 2021-2022 Maryland Teacher of the Year finalist and Charles County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. Ms. Hungerford will receive a resolution from the board and is presented by Mr. Benjamin Harrington, Principal Arthur, Middle, Middleton, Arthur Middleton Elementary School. Good evening. I'm Ben Harrington, the Principal Arthur Middleton Elementary. Thank you for allowing me to present an incredible teacher to you tonight. Um, hard work, dedication, ingenuity, and cre creativity are just a few words that describe Ms. Morgan Hungerford. Uh, Ms. Hungerford was recruited by our current principal of the year, Mr. D'Ambrosio, and who I want to sincerely thank because she's been an incredible asset to our team and our community. Morgan has a passion and an energy for teaching that's consuming and infectious. At any time of day, morning or night, Ms. Hungerford is at the ready, prepared to talk data, thinking of ways to make learning experiences authentic for students or the entire school. Ms. Hungerford may be one of the most involved people at Arthur Middleton and in our history at Arthur Middleton. She has dedicated herself to being our PTO president when we couldn't get anybody to volunteer for that position, thank you. Relay for Life team leader, second grade team leader, as well as a leader of DI and MESA. She even volunteered um, years past to change grade levels be for convenience for our staffing purposes. <coughs> when there was an event that takes place, Morgan is there helping or coordinating the event. She was always optimistic and truly cares for all members of our community. Weekly, Ms. Hungerford can be seen at her team planning on Thursday mornings, providing a miniature professional development for her team of all first year teachers. Ms. Hungerford completed her admin internship last year with a large portion being leading the Summer Boost program at Barry Elementary, which is one of the largest schools in Charles County. She took on this challenge with a smile and her positive attitude. From all accounts, because of her leadership and motivation, the program was very successful there. Recently, at a celebratory dinner hosted by her parents, thank you, <laughs> one story was shared. I don't recall all the specifics or who it was from because at this restaurant, we had a table of about 10 people, and I believe everybody in the restaurant knew Miss Hungerford. Um, <laughs> but it was mentioned that her passion for teaching began at the pool when she was very young. She, uh, Morgan at that time took opportunities to provide direct instruction to other members at the pool to ensure they were safe <laughs> while she was the teacher at the pool. <laughs> Fast forward a few short years, and now we're standing here honoring Miss Hungerford for her contributions to our school and our community. Morgan, the impact that you've had on our students, on your colleagues, and the profession is just the beginning. I'm proud of the work you've done at Arthur Middleton since I've been there for four years, and I look forward to seeing more great things from you. Your future is bright, and be ready because this year will be full of great opportunities and experiences as the Charles County Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. Hi, Ms. Hungerford. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? You know, 
something just popped in my head. Did I come read to your class one time or read yeah, across? Yeah, like right before we shut down for COVID. Yeah, you did. I yeah. You did. <laughs> right. I have a picture. <laughs> awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank yes. you. Yes, some things you'd like to say? I do. I am humbled and honored to have been named the Charles County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. I was lucky enough to receive the best education from this system since I entered pre-kindergarten and am even more lucky to work for the system that played a major role in raising me into the teacher in person that I am today. Having the opportunity to represent the amazing teachers in this system, some of which taught me, is the greatest honor of my lifetime. This honor has led me to reflecting on the people who've, who've mentored and supported me. To the most important people in my classroom, each and every one of the 153 students that I've taught over the last six years, thank you for your perseverance, determination, and growth mindsets. You are my why. <clears throat> I would like to thank Mr. D'Ambrosio for taking a chance on me and his continued mentorship, as well as Mr. Harrington for his mentorship and providing me with the opportunities to become a stronger teacher and leader. My Middleton family for being my sounding board, my listening ear, and they're there every day to support me, as well as my family, specifically my mom and my dad, because I can say without any hesitation that I would not be the person that I am today without their honesty, support, and guidance. Finally, I would like to thank the parents of the students that I've had the utmost honor in teaching. Thank you for sharing your kiddos with me and allowing me to be just a small part of their journey. line of, of educators and um, I remember coming into your class I mean I've been to a lot of classrooms but I remember you know maybe it was COVID but um, <laughs> you 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 could tell you you had it going on I mean you just know when a teacher is doing a great job and Thank you. Um, I, I definitely remember that so congratulations again is there anything that board members want to say Rock. thank yeah, you yeah. <laughs> thank you all right thank you very much thank you to introduce this year's Outstanding Vice Principal of the Year, Tamika Little from Henry E. Lackey High School, presented by Ms. Kathy Perillo, Principal. Good afternoon. It is with great Charger pride I introduce Ms. Tamika Little. Ms. Tamika Little is a long-standing vice principal with Charles County Public Schools. But as you can see from her blue dress, she, blue, she bleeds uh, Henry E. Lackey Charger with the blue and silver. And she landed at Henry E. Lackey High School with me six years ago. Currently, and in the past few years, she has served as the principal's designee and that is a role that is taken very seriously, and I have the utmost trust in her. She has also served as a um, 12th grade administrator for two years, and most recently with the graduating class of 2022. She is also our PBIS coordinator, as well as our facilitator for our new teacher induction program, our, which we call the Chew and Chat program. 
-hmm. I could go on and on with the number of responsibilities that Ms. Little has facilitated and led over her tenure of six years at Henry E. Lackey High School. Every single thing that she does, she completes with greatness. Board members, you have heard me speak over the years of the GREAT philosophy. It's an acronym for Growth, Relationships, Excellence, Accountability, and Teamwork. And Miss Little epitomizes every attribute of the GREAT philosophy. Though I will say her greatest strength, no pun intended, is the relationship building. They say that you have to develop a thick skin when you become an administrator. And I can attest that Ms. Little takes things personally sometimes, but that's not a weakness. She takes things personally when it comes to students in our building. And if times that they struggle and she feels as though she, she doesn't know what else to do and we brainstorm, and we, we really don't know. And when we don't have the answers, that's when she takes it personally. So <coughs> it is with great charger provide, uh, pride I present to you, Ms. Tamika Little. This is a recognition that is well deserved, but it's also long overdue. Yeah. Ms. Absolutely. Congratulations. It is well deserved. I, I, I've heard your name come up only in the most positive of ways uh, many times. So thank you uh, for working in our school system. Really do appreciate it. Anything you'd like to say? Yes. It is a tremendous privilege to be before you today to accept the award for Outstanding Vice Principal of Charles County Public Schools. First, I want to say how deeply honored I am to be chosen for this award to the great team at Lackey, Mrs. Perello, Ms. Nissen, Mr. Wilk, Mr. Mosey, our AD John Lush. I thank you for always having my back, pushing me to be great and for being present every day for our school and community. To our teachers and all the staff at Lackey, thank you for your love and dedication you show to our students as evidenced by the hard work you do each and every day. To my dad for showing me the value of hard work. To my husband, Rico, Thank you for putting up with my long hours, <laughs> missed dinners and forgotten tasks, for your patience and dedication to our family and for your love and support. To my children, Devin and Delaney, please know that I am beyond blessed to be your mom. I am thankful for your thoughtfulness and understanding when I've had to miss one of your games, concerts or events. I'm awed by your displays of love through your words and actions that you show to support me when I need the most. I thank the leadership of Charles County Public Schools, the Board of Education members, Superintendent Dr. Navarro, and the executive staff, because the work you do is not easy, but it is necessary to ensure that education in Charles County remains superior. And finally, my message to all the teachers and staff that leave their homes early, arrive home late, loaded with papers and projects to grade, that regularly give up their own lunch periods to help our students those that sometimes feel underappreciated and undervalued. My message to you is that you are treasured and the work that you're doing is helping change the world one child at a time. The children of Charles County are better because of you. Learning might begin in the classroom, but we all know it does not end there. Teachers, you guide students to roads that take them through life. You inspire students to learn. And as John Dewey said, education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. So while I'll be eternally grateful and thankful for this recognition, I leave here knowing that the greater work is yet to be done. As a proud educator, I accept the challenge. Right. And Ms. McGraw has something for you. Thank you. 
McGraw, did you wear that today just for lackey? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we now have a resolution to be read for uh, inclusion and <coughs> diversity month and accepting will be Miss Kimberly Hairston. Yes, and Miss Wilson will read that. The Board of Education of Charles County on June 14th, 2022 officially presents the inclusion and diversity resolution. Whereas the students and staff of Charles County Public Schools have unique, rich cultural histories, backgrounds, and personal experiences deserving of respect. And whereas Charles County Public Schools students and staff members have a right and deserve to feel accepted and safe while at school and beyond and whereas the Board of Education recognizes the champions of inclusion and diversity who have made extraordinary sacrifices in the fight for civil and human rights, and whereas the Board of Education reaffirms its commitment to shared values of respect, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and whereas the Charles County Public School student population is diverse exposing our students to perspectives from different backgrounds, which enhances learning, problem solving, and helps them function better in a multicultural global society. And whereas the Board of Education supports diversity among its staff and encourages the school system to be proactive in the recruiting and hiring of highly qualified teachers who can share diverse cultural experiences and serve as role models for students. And whereas the Board of Education of Charles County recognizes that there is a need to create a continuum of diversity and inclusion in schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County declares the month of June as Inclusion and Diversity Month in Charles County Public Schools and that we continue to respect the value of all cultures and lifestyles and be it further resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County declares the month of June as Inclusion and Diversity Month in Charles County Public Schools and that we continue to respect the value of all cultures and lifestyles and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be inserted in the minutes of the June 14th, 2022 board meeting, signed Mr. Michael Lucas, chairperson, Dr. Maria Navarro, superintendent of schools. my pleasure to present the 2021 outstanding non-certificated staff along with their supervisors who will come forward to share a few words. 
Our first recipient for the Technology Support Award is Mr. Nia Dang, a computer analyst too from the Jesse L. Starkey Administration Building, and he's presented by Ms. Laura Bennett, Executive Director of IT Strategy. Good evening. It is with great honor that I introduce to you Nia Dang. Nia began working for Charles County Public Schools Technology Department in 2009 as a computer intern. In his 13 years with our school system, he has primarily supported the central office, which is comprised of the Jesse Starkey Admin Building, the Maintenance Building, Annex 1, and Annex 2. For five years, he also supported the F.B. Gwynn Educational Center while still supporting Central. When Nia began, he was a temporary employee that was hired to help with the repairs of our equipment out of our repair office, and he quickly became embedded in that office. Within a year, he was hired as a full-time computer analyst to support Gwen and assist with the repair office. And after five years, he was promoted to computer analyst two and became the primary contact for the central office. He is considered <laughs> one of our experts in hardware issues and often gives advice to our other staff on difficult issues. Being the technology support for these buildings creates challenges not typically encountered at schools. There are meetings with staff and members of the public that he needs to support and specialized hardware and software not used in the rest of the school system. <coughs> Nia has always taken these challenges in stride with a smile on his face. He is always willing to assist and takes great pride in his work. I have regularly been told by staff that they appreciate how hard he worked on an issue and that they appreciated his diligence in solving it. He sets an example for our staff with his kind, thoughtful, pleasant attitude and his willingness to help everyone. It is my pleasure to see him honored with the award of Outstanding Technology Support Employee for Charles County Public Schools. Our next recipient for the Instructional Support Award is Ms. Tricia Mahal, a technology facilitator from Dr. Thomas L. Higdon Elementary School, and she'll be presented by her principal, Dr. Shannon Finnegan. Good evening, it's with great pleasure that I present to you Ms. Tricia Mee Hall. Every great story happened when someone decided not to give up. That's a quote that exemplifies Tricia Mee Hall. My first encounter with Ms. Mee Hall was several years ago when she served as an instructional assistant for a student that had very challenging behaviors. During this period, Mrs. Mehal refused to give up, while many would have, and she exercised great strength, perseverance, skill, judgment that resulted in success for that student. Mrs. Mehal then and now consistently exudes respect, care, and concern for all students, especially those students that are trying. Ms. Mehal currently holds the position of technology facilitator at Dr. Higdon, and she's continually showing initiation and innovation within her job. Dr. Dre states that you have to find that special thing about you that distinguishes you from all others, and through true talent, hard work, and passion, anything can happen. Well, that special thing about Ms. Mehal is her ability to persevere while extending grace and patience to both students and staff. She utilizes her talent for technology and innovation and makes things happen. Ms. Mehal provides a variety of technical skills to students and staff as she collaborates with the classroom teachers, ILT, and administration to ensure that technology is embedded throughout the school. Ms. Mehal is not a stranger to hard work or tackling difficult projects. Derek Jeter says that there has to be a mindset that you're not afraid to fail. The calmer you are, the more games 
move, this slows down for you. And I think part of that is controlling your emotions. Well, when the pandemic hit, high emotions ran throughout our school system when we were asked to tackle the unknown of virtual learning. Mrs. Mehal fearlessly availed herself to staff, students, and parents for troubleshooting technological difficulty support to support our students' access to virtual learning. Even while on leave, Mrs. Mehal answered her phone and spent time troubleshooting technical issues relating to students accessing the virtual instruction. And more than once, Ms. Mehal came early every day to provide parents one-on-one -on -one support to help them navigating, signing into parent view, or to set up hotspots. Mrs. Mehal's dedication knows no boundaries. She goes above and beyond her job duties to support her students and staff. It is a great pleasure that she receives this award. Thank you, Ms. Mehal. Our next recipient for the Food Service Support Award is Ms. Sarah Martin, Food Service Manager from John Hanson Middle School, and she's presented by Mr. Benjamin Colehurst, Principal. <laughs> okay. I just want to express to the entire room that this did not come from the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Ben Kors, I'm principal of John Hanson Middle School. That is a fiddle fig. All right, that little unassuming house plant is one of my favorites because once you get it home and you put it in a spot that it loves, it requires very little attention to operate, do its thing, and become beautiful in its space. That is Sarah Martin at John Hanson Middle School. I walk into the building every single day the same path. I walk past the dumpsters, into the back door, past my building service manager's closed door, and into the kitchen where I'm welcomed by six smiling faces, sometimes four, sometimes three. Depends on who's there. But Sarah is there every single day, doing her job, making sure that everybody is fed breakfast and lunch at John Hanson Middle School. There's never a problem for Sarah. I feel like I have a thousand problems, and I show my problems visibly. <laughs> Sarah has no problems, or if she does, she doesn't show them. She quietly walks up to the front office, says, hey, I'm down two people. We're only going to have two lines today. I said, do you need anything? No, we'll take care of it. Anytime there's a field trip that we forget to tell the cafeteria, that another grade level is going to be eating lunch at 11.30, Sarah says, we'll take care of it. I need 60 bag lunches. SGA is leaving today. I'll take care of it. There's never been a time that I've come to Sarah where she has not acknowledged it and then got the job done. So anytime anyone comes through John Hanson Middle School, you're going to leave with a plant if you work there at some <laughs> point or another. Now, the size of the plant depends on what's happening. Are you relocating out of the area? You're going to get a tiny one. We did, this day. did you get a promotion? We'll give you a medium sized one. But the ones that come in this size from us at John Hanson Middle School come to those that have committed to a school system, have done their job every single day, and now are getting ready to retire and enjoy the next part of things. So, Sarah, I hope it's not a surprise to the room, but I know, and I know you know, and I think I know Bill knows because he's got some big shoes to fill at John Hanson Middle School. This award is well-deserved for Sarah, and I'm proud to say that she was John Hanson Middle School's cafeteria manager for 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> Our next recipient 
is for the maintenance award, and it is Ms. Dorica Gray, a stock keeper from the Charles County Public Schools Maintenance Shop, presented by Mr. Steve Vance, Supervisor of Maintenance. Good afternoon. I'd like to first off start by saying when we get a phone call tomorrow that Dr. Navarro's favorite plant's missing from the main <laughs> We're immediately going to panic in the maintenance shop because we're not going to remember exactly what that was. And <laughs> this shows you the value that Miss Gray is to our department because not only will she know that plant, she'll come to us with five different places that we can have it <laughs> before the day is over. And nobody will know it's gone. Um, I'm honored to present the Outstanding Classified Support Staff Award for the Maintenance Department to Mr. Rika Gray. Ms. Dorica Gray began her career with Charles County Public Schools in April of 2010. She currently works as our stock keeper in our maintenance building across the street. During the last 12 years, she has been responsible for maintaining an inventory of items routinely used to service our facilities. The inventory supports multiple trades, including electrical, HVAC, plumbing, security, carpentry, grounds, and automotive fleet. The varying age of our facilities can make it a challenge at times to locate items ranging from obsolete to brand new technology. No matter the age of the items, Ms. Gray is always resourceful in finding the answer to the problem. Ms. Gray's professionalism, resourcefulness, and positive attitude make her an asset to Charles County Public Schools. Ms. Gray is truly deserving of the Outstanding Support Staff Award. I'm honored to work with her and would like to thank Ms. Gray for everything she does for the system. Our next recipient of this first five is for the Secretarial Support Award, and that, and that is Ms. Deepa Patel, Secretary to the Principal from Dr. Samuel A. Mudd Elementary School, and she'll be presented by Ms. Orlena Watley, her principal. Good evening. Deepa's mantra. Always render more and better service than is expected of you, no matter what your task may be. This is the essence of who Deepa is. No task is ever too small or ever too big. She handles it, she handles it with a smile and with the most utmost professionalism. She is not only my left hand, my right hand, and sometimes I think we were born twins. <laughs> That's how much she is in sync with what needs to be done at the school. So it has been a great honor to recognize Deepa. She has been a valuable family member at Dr. Samuel E. Mudd for over 13 years. Throughout her tenure, she has been a dedicated and valued member of our school family who seeks to build relationships, make connections to both students, staff, and parents. Her goal is to remove barriers so that others can thrive. She does this when students need supplies and they come to the office, they go straight to see Deepa. When staff members come to the office and they need something, they go straight to Deepa. When a substitute comes in the building, they all know Deepa. When I come to work, I look for Deepa. <laughs> she, is giving, she gives unselfishly of herself and never asks for anything in return. Deepa is revered by the staff and our school community that we serve. Her dedication to the students at Dr. Mudd go unmatched. Her colleagues hold her in the highest regard and the children love her. She even does lunch bunch. She has check in, check out. She is that go to when our students and staff just need someone to talk to. And just as my fellow colleagues said, it's about building relationships, she builds relationships. I speak with many parents and their remarks are the same and even with staff when they speak about Ms. Patel. They speak of someone who is caring, who is kind and considerate. Ms. Patel's dedication and commitment to our families and staff is evident through everything she does. She comes to school early every morning and stays late to ensure everything is prepared and ready for the next day. She is a role model for other principal secretaries. She's just a role model, period, without a title. She is often seen navigating through the system and serving as a resource for other principal secretaries 
or just any employee who needs a lending hand, a, a lending hand or an ear for listening. She pays it forward because that is who she is. If you ask Ms. Patel why she dedicates so much of her time in learning about our families, helping out other secretaries, helping out everyone who is in need, she, simp she simply states, our staff and families deserve nothing less. This is who she is. She is considered our financial secretary guru. She is the most efficient secretary I have ever met. Again, as I stated, there is no task too big or no, no task too small that she cannot manage. She has that great attention to detail that we rely on. If you have a question, everyone knows who to go see. Ms. Patel is the, con the consummate professional. If there was a picture in the dictionary beside the definition of amazing, you would see her picture. She is beyond deserving, and I am privileged to have the honor of working alongside her. Board, I present to you Ms. Deepa Patel as our non-certificated staff member of the year. You have more, right? We do. We have but two more after right. this group. But you can't leave yet. No, we want you all to stay, so don't leave. Yeah. Well, we got to bring so the other two down. Yeah. Um, do you want to have them say something now, or you want to bring the other two down? Let's have them say something now. That way they Perfect. Can, the other two can come and sit. We'll start on the end. Oh, I'm the lucky one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, even board members, good evening, Super uh, Lieutenant Navarro. Mm -hmm. um, I'm honored to be here tonight to accept this award. Um, I don't know what else to say. First, I want to say thank you to my entire technology team. Um, I don't get to say this every day. I work with them, and I don't get to see them every day. But this is the best opportunity I can say that to every one of them. Uh, without teamwork, without getting answer from each other every day, asking how you do this, how you do that, um, this wouldn't be possible for me. Um, I would like to thank you, my, all my managers, um, Jill Warren, Laura Bennett, um, Shaman Thompson. Um, thanks to all of them for giving us all the support all the approval that we get every day to support um, everyone. Um, additionally, I would like to thank my family who wouldn't be here today. Um, they actually travel so they're on their way back from my hometown. So um, um, they couldn't be here. Um, what motivation that I have coming to work every day knowing that I make sure I have to fix all these machines, whether, whether it's for a teacher's building, but it has to be fixed. Um, if I can't get these machines fixed for the teacher's staff, then obviously they're not going to be able to support our student. Uh, that's what motivated me the most. Uh, coming to work every day, knowing that um, if technology equipment runs smoothly and they can turn around and you know better serve our children in, in the county. Um, so thanks everyone for this recognition. Thank you. Sir. Tricia, how are you? Thank you, Dr. Finnegan, for this acknowledgement, and thank you to my fabulous coworkers. I am so proud to be part of the Higdon team. Thank you, Superintendent Dr. Navarro and fellow board members for this recognition. I'm truly grateful. And thank you to my friends and family for their love and support, especially my husband, Joe, and our boys, Andrew and Joey. As parents of two young boys, my husband and I had our first experience with Dr. Higdon Elementary School almost 15 years ago when our oldest son was starting pre-K. From the beginning, we both knew this was a special school. 
Two years later, it was our youngest son's turn to start school, and that's when I found the time to volunteer, getting to know the staff and teachers a little bit better. A couple years later after that, I became a substitute teacher, and that's when I gained a whole new level of respect for the special <laughs> individuals that choose to enter into the field of education. I then became a special education instructional assistant, and then eventually, currently, technology facilitator, which is better known as the computer teacher. I jokingly say at times my boys went to Higdon, but I was the one who ended up staying. I have to say this is one of the best decisions I've made. Because I stayed, it has given me the opportunity over the years to work with some of the most dedicated teachers, support staff, principals, and vice principals in Charles County. Our school provides not only for myself and my family, but many others, a connection to our close-knit, supportive community. It has played a big part in creating meaningful, close relationships with other families and their children who grew up together with our sons, attending Higdon, then middle school and eventually high school together. There have been generations of students and families who share the same experiences, and it all began at this very special school with some very special people. And now, here we are almost 15 years later, and in just a couple of months, and after a well-deserved summer break, <laughs> Our son, our youngest son, Joey, will be a junior at La Plata High School. Our oldest, Andrew, will be a sophomore at Salisbury University. And I will always be grateful that I stayed and will continue to stay at Dr. Higdon Elementary School. Thank you. Ms. Martin? Yes. Um, I'm very proud to be a food and nutrition service worker, and our mission is to feed the future. I take my job very seriously, and I think my staff helped me make it through the many years of doing this so successfully, and I want to thank the principal and the school staff also. I want to thank my supervisor, Mr. Cruder, and I want to thank the board and the superintendent of schools for your appreciation. Hi, Ms. Patel. It is an honor, a huge honor for me to be receiving this Outstanding Non-Certificated Staff Award. I would like to dedicate this award to my entire Dr. Mudd school family who strives to be the best and outstanding each and every day. I love my family and I'm proud to be part of Charles County Public School. I would like to thank Ms. Watley, Ms. Soderstrom and all the members of Dr. Mudd family for nominating me and recognizing my efforts, my contribution to the school and respecting my work that I do. I'm grateful for the recognition I have received for my work because I'm sure that every nominee, every nominee for this award goes above and beyond in their respective school to ensure the true focus is on the students teaching and learning. Everyone deserves this award. Every secretary, what they go through every day, in and out, <laughs> we all know they, they do deserve this award. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge my parents, my husband, my daughters, and my friends. I wouldn't be standing here and receiving this award if it wasn't for their love, support, patience, and inspiration. I love you all, and thank you very much, all the board members, Dr. Navarro, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Oh, hi, hello, everyone. <laughs> thank you. I just want to say thank you um, for recognizing me. Um, uh, I want to say thank you to my family uh, for supporting me at home. Sometimes I come home frustrated because I can't find something or uh, they're telling me something 40 weeks out. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's, it gets frustrating, especially uh, these last couple of years. So I just want to say thank you for the recognition. And I try hard every day to, to keep the schools going. Well, you succeed. That's obvious. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we have.
have a little uh, memento for you and uh, come up one at a time and we'll get a picture. Who's first? Thank you all very much for your service. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. All right, please continue. Okay, as we continue with our non-certificate award winners, our next recipient for the Building Service Award is Mr. Raymond Lancaster, Building Service Manager from Thomas Stone High School, and he'll be represented by his principal, Ms. Shanique Pearl. Good afternoon. Outstanding work ethic and positive disposition makes Mr. Raymond Lancaster a pleasure to work with as he serves as Thomas Stone's building service manager. He possesses a work ethic that is driven by his own personal values, which mean he, he upholds these standards whether publicly recognized or not. Mr. Lancaster's attention to detail sets him to approach any task that he takes on with precision that is unmatched. Mr. Lancaster is a template for efficacy and efficiency after which others can model themselves to achieve success. He takes an active role in helping to train and mentor building service workers and managers. 
He continuously sets high standards for himself and for those who are watching him. Mr. Lancaster indeed is a great leader for his fellow building service workers. His efforts directly contribute to making our school conducive to learning by providing a welcoming and enjoyable atmosphere. Professional, committed, and caring, Mr. Lancaster leads his team by example with a list of duties that would be difficult, if not impossible, to summarize. Both outdoors and indoors, he ensures the beautification and upkeep of our campus by maintaining a daily routine inclusive for everyone from the grounds, maintenance, trash pickup to sanitation and emergency intervention. Mr. Lancaster has gone above and beyond making sure all protocols are followed so that students and staff are in a clean and safe environment. Punctual, consistent, and flexible, Mr. Lancaster is not only present essentially every day, but also early, oftentimes when unexpected incident emerge during the duty day that require building service assistance, he is the first to respond. Many days after completing his work at Thomas Stone, Mr. Lancaster picks up additional shifts in the evenings to provide support to other buildings around the school, around the school, I'm sorry, around the county. His personal passion for work that he does is conveyed in his constant execution of any, of any assignment with extreme excellence, leaving an indelible impact on our school. Mr. Lancaster is undoubtedly an integral part of the building service crew, and our school is certainly made better because of him. Mr. Lancaster is more than deserving of the outstanding support staff employee honor. Our final recipient for this evening for the Operations Award is Mr. Joey Matera, Field Service Foreman from Charles County Public Schools Annex 1, and he'll be presented by Ms. April Murphy, Supervisor of Operations. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to be here today to present Mr. Emilio Joey Matera with the Outstanding Support Staff Award for school year 21-22. Mr. Matera started his career with Charles County Public Schools in 2011. He is currently the field service foreman. He and his team are the backbone of the operations department. Mr. Matera is a true professional. He handles each assignment with an attention to detail, leaving nothing to chance. He is an absolute perfectionist. Mr. Matera is someone that I can count on in any, way, any situation. He is a leader that works with his staff to ensure that they are trained properly. Joey appreciates that the service he and his staff provide to schools enables school-based staff to do their jobs efficiently. Building service staff knows that if they call Joey with an issue or need, he will do whatever he needs to do to ensure they are taken care of. During the pandemic, Mr. Matera didn't telework or work every other week. He and his entire team worked every single day to ensure the operations department was providing support to schools, delivering supplies, fogging buildings, sourcing PPE. Joey and his team were true heroes when CCPS needed them most. I'm consistently impressed with his work ethic, his dedication, and his get it done attitude. Mr. Matera is an asset to Charles County Public Schools. He is a leader and it is my privilege to call him a colleague. Gentlemen, pretty high accolades there. Um, Mr. Lancaster, is there anything you'd like to say? Say, <clears throat> say something a little short. Uh, when you say, when, <laughs> when they say you got butterflies, you have butterflies. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to say, but um, I'd like to thank Ms. Pearl for recognizing me as um, nominating me for um, Outstanding um, Building Service Manager. Um, also, I'd like to thank Ms. April Murphy also for allowing me to go out and mentor different um, managers and also system managers and workers. Um, I'd like to take a lot of weight off Ms. Pearl when I come to Thomas Stone High School in the morning because if I tell her everything, she she probably lose her mind. <laughs> so I pretty much like to like to take a lot of weight off. I don't even like to discuss too much stuff what goes on in the field. I kind of let myself. <laughs> um, but I like to thank my wife. Uh, when for her, I wouldn't be doing all this overtime and working late nights. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I you like have to, to tell thank us. We know. <laughs> 
So I really appreciate this. Um, um, I really thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Matera. Thank you. Hmm. I would like to thank, thank April Murphy for nominating me for this award. Having a supervisor as dedicated as April makes it easy to come to work and do my best. I supervise five guys that do a great job and are always willing to do what is asked of them. I would also like to thank Tracy Cundiff, Operations Secretary, for all she does for me. Um, I would also like to thank my wife, Tracy, for always being supportive of everything I do. Thank you to the board and Dr. Navarro for this award as well. You as well. We're going to get a picture. Who has Mr. Lancaster? Come on up, Mr. Lancaster. Chairperson Lucas, did we want to get one group picture of everybody? Yes, that is a great idea. Would all the recipients of our non-support staff stand, non-certificated staff stand on the stage? People up here voting, should they get their plaques or not? That's everything, That's correct? It. I will turn it back over to you, Chairperson Lucas. All right, so. Kyle. Welcome back, everyone. It is now 6 p.m. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, I will hand it over to you. I will read the rules for public forum. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any, or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. This evening we have five speakers in person and five speakers signed up virtually. The first speaker we'll call is Veronica Golden.
Good evening, Chairman Lucas, Dr. Navarro, and members of the board. My name is Veronica Golden, and I am the proud art teacher at Gail Bailey Elementary. I am coming before you this evening as a concerned educator, community member, and future parent of a Charles County student. Four weeks ago, my world was turned upside down. The school system that I worked so hard to advocate for failed me, my fellow educators, and my students. A threat was made against my school, but as a staff, we were not respected as the adults and professionals we are to be alerted to it. My administrators did everything that they could within their power to keep us safe, but why should the sole responsibility be placed on two individuals when the staff could have been vigilant? We, uh, while we did not need to know all the details, an email could have gone out that there was a threat in the community and we could have used one of the codes we practice, but we were never given such an opportunity. Why have codes if they're not enacted? There have been many excuses placing fault on CCSO to making flippant remarks that the threat was not credible due to the individual's disability before CCSO had even completed their investigation. Since the incident involving Gail Bailey, there have been seven other reported incidences involving CCSO since the beginning of the school year. There have been 46 reported incidences involving CCSO, 41 of which, um, 41 of those have occurred since we came back from the wind break. Most of these cases have involved drugs, threats of mass violence, and possession of replica weapons. This information has come from CCSO's press releases and does not even begin to paint the full picture of the student behaviors in our schools. As a violence and crime have begun to escalate in our school communities, the same has happened in our schools, from the classroom to the hallways to the buses. While I do not expect you to solve all that is occurring in the communities, there are things that can be done within our schools to help. Uh, you have already been presented with a variety of solutions from community members, including effective use of ISR, requiring exit meetings with school counselor or school administrator and the use of restorative practices. I also suggest that school administrators receive formal training in restorative practices, with the caveat being that student code and conduct still needs to be enforced consistently and appropriately. There needs to be stronger emphasis on social emotional learning. Teachers need training and de-escalation strategies to help calm students who are in distress until a counselor or administrator is available. We are in a time of crisis. Teachers are leaving because they feel unsafe. Many are being assaulted verbally and physically every day, and others are not joining the profession because they see the lack of respect that is paid to educators. I am asking you, with your time remaining in office, to go out strong, go into the schools, talk with staff, um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> to go out strong, go into the schools, talk with staff, and listen to what is needed. All of Charles County schools need to be a safe place to teach and to learn. We as educators need to have faith that district leadership is doing everything they can to keep us and our students safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. This year was always going to be difficult. From the start, we knew we'd have to establish continuity of learning plans, help students readjust to in-person learning, reestablish routines and procedures, and begin the long, hard work of closing learning gaps that were exacerbated by the pandemic. Some of those difficulties were out of our control, but others we created for ourselves. Every school year seems to have a buzzword or a theme that comes to describe the year, and the word grace quickly filled that role this school year. And while we had every good intention by showing grace to, to students this year, grace became our undoing. In November, I rejoined the ACC Executive Board. And in board meeting after board meeting, our EACC Executive Board members raised their concerns about student behaviors, a lack of administrative responses, and the impact that these events were having on school safety. One shared a story of watching an administrator being cursed out by a student because that administrator had the audacity to ask the student to go to class. We all remember the Instagram fight pages the schools had for a hot second there earlier in the school year. And I was saddened and angered to watch a good friend of mine and a rock star administrator in this county get tossed over a student's shoulder and into a wall as they tried to break up a fight. Another executive board member shared a story of a teacher trying to redo a seating chart only to be told by the student, this is my effing seat, get out of my face. Another executive board member shared a story where students suddenly all left the classroom because they heard there was a fight somewhere in the building. There was no fight in the building. There was also no consequence for that. We've all read the letters that have been sent home in the last number of days about weapons being recovered in schools. Too much grace 
and a lack of a meaningful consequence has greenlit dangerous and disruptive student behaviors. And devastatingly, our worst fears came to pass last week at Thomas Stone High School, when students felt empowered to leave classrooms, head to fights, throw desks, and send a staff member on a medical flight to Baltimore, a school that I taught at and a staff member that I know. Grace has somehow become an excuse for excusing student behaviors we never would have accepted as late as the 2019-2020 school year. As Veronica said, this summer begins the final months of this board's term in office. Some of you are not running for re-election. This is your last chance. I implore you to use your last months on the board to look long and hard at our student code of conduct and how it's enforced in our schools. We can be restorative, but also insist that school rules are followed, staff are respected, and learning and safety is at the forefront. If students don't feel safe, they won't engage. If the learning environment is chaotic, we cannot close learning gaps. If staff don't feel respected, they will continue to leave. The code of conduct cannot just be a suggestion. It has to be real. It has to mean something. Actions have to have consequences. We cannot have another school year like this. If we do, our resignation list is going to be devastating, more devastating than it probably already is. Please take back control of our schools. Let's not have another school year like this. Thank you. My name is Melissa and I teach second grade. I came today to talk about teacher retention. I asked her the teachers thought of solutions. Yes. Sure, I'm, I was wondering why I couldn't see anyone, sure. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I'm going to go ahead and mute you, and we'll call on you in just a few more minutes, okay? Sure, absolutely. All right, thank you. It's like ventriloquist. How did you do that? I thought you were talking about you, like, Good evening, my name is Melissa Carpenter, and I am a lifelong resident of Charles County, a graduate of CCPS, as well as a teacher here. And I wanted to come again to share from the viewpoint of a teacher. Wow, I can't believe we only have one more student day left. Um, to the educators out there, congratulations. We made it through a year that seemed to up the challenge each and every month. When I first wrote this speech, I wanted to leave you with a few anecdotal comments from the classroom over the last few weeks. But then things changed again. We have to do better. In September and October, I came and shared about the overwhelming workload. In November, I begged for help. In December, I shared how the great number of open positions affects everyone in the school buildings. In January, I shared how COVID absences added new challenges. February brought attention to the need for more school counselors, especially in elementary. March, I shared the massive amount of special education support disruptions. April, I cautioned that this time of year and testing season br brings more safe screens and threat assessments, especially when supports aren't being met all year long. May, I shared my hope for, the plan, for a plan for the future. This month, I beg you to use this summer effectively. Because while I thought the list was long enough, I have to add safety. Safety to our students, safety to our staff, safety to our community. I'm not asking the school to be security guards, but there are plenty of things in our school system that can be changed and modified to create safer schools. So many of the things I've come month after month and talked about could help improve the safety in our schools. Your educators and employees in the buildings throughout the county have a lot of ideas. What are you doing to hear them out? What are, we doing, uh, what are you doing to reassure the community our schools are safe? If educators don't feel safe, how can they reassure students and their families? I heard a teacher this year, retired military, describe feeling safer deployed to the Middle East than she did in her elementary classroom. That was in December. Many started this year tired and are leaving this year questioning. We have to do better. And it has to start this summer. Please don't wait till August or September to start gathering people and making plans. As I've said before, I hope this starts the conversation with teachers and all of our educators in our buildings and not about us. Good evening. 
My name is Teresa Hicks. I am currently a parent of one and soon to be two st students attending Thomas Stone High School. I'm also a parent that is in support of all of our teachers and administrators. As we all know, a horrible incident happened at Thomas Stone. As I received the text from the school, as every other parent did, I was very concerned for my child, but was very sad for the teacher, <coughs> excuse me, that was affected. Later I found out who the teacher was, and it was saddened to turn into anger because I know that teacher, and we are very good friends. This hit too close to home this time, and I felt helpless. I talked to my daughter about the incident and explained to her about what your actions could lead to, and it was the type of situation. I also explained to her that the situation could have taken a very bad turn in a split second. We were so thankful it didn't. I come to you today because I don't feel you as a board and our county support your teachers and admins at all of our schools. There has been too many bad, bad changes and laws and rules that you have put into place that no longer support our teachers. You hire them to do a job, but at the end, all you're doing is throwing them out to the wolves and hope they survive. There are so many new members on this board from the last time I was here and unfortunately, I voted for you because we talked outside this very building and you gave me your promise that you would make changes for our kids and our teachers. And I'm sad to say I don't see any of it. I have witnessed as well as been told of very different situations that have happened at all levels of school. As a result of these situations, as a teacher, it usually is first to be punished and then the good students are next. I think, of all of, I think all of you need to figure out a different way to investigate these situations because 95% of the time, it's the student who is at fault. Hold the teachers at the board for weeks at times does not help you, does not help the students left in their classroom, and it does not help the school and or the teacher. The amount of time it takes for you to all investigate is what they call in teacher jail, an accident in a short few hours, Excuse me. The amount of times it takes for you to all to um, investigate or figure out what has happened is way too long. Police can investigate an accident in a short few hours with nothing to go on. Whereas the board takes weeks and these teachers are held here when they have cameras and witnesses and so much more to these incidents. I really hope that you listen to me as well as all of these other people here tonight having great messages and try to fix all of these issues that the county has and the board has. I really need you to support your teachers so nothing ever again happens to any teacher like what happened at Thomas Stone. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pascal Small. Good evening. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. My name is Pascal Small. I'm gonna have to tippy toe. <laughs> I'm a mom of three and a parent leader with Charles County Rise. I actually wasn't planning on speaking today, but I felt I had to make sure um, you heard from a parent's perspective that we're extremely concerned about lowering the required GPA to participate in extracurricular activities in Charles County Public Schools. I, like many parents, were not able to watch the beginning of our board meetings, and many don't because it's during the work hours, so forgive me if we've already discussed this. And from what our teachers are talking about today, it almost feels like we shouldn't even have to discuss this because there's so many other issues. But bear with me. As disparities and outcomes persist and widen, right now it just does not feel the time to lower our standards. And let me share a little bit about the reality right now across our country and in our county, though you all know it, but for the people maybe listening that don't, in our county, kids aren't meeting the necessary milestones to be prepared for college or career. They're not bound for anything. Our reading and math diagnostics show too many children are not at grade level in math and reading. We have a decline in college enrollment and persistence is worsening. 60% of college students take at least one remedial, cor remedial course. And these numbers reveal that high school diplomas, no matter how recently earned, doesn't guarantee that students are prepared for college courses. And now we are actually having a conversation about lowering the standard even more. So we come with solutions because I know you guys like for us not to just come and complain. <laughs> so what we're recommending is, and many of you have already talked about this, 
that we do allow students to have a clean slate coming in the ninth grade, which is again something you've considered, that we create an academic probation program for students not meeting the requirements so they get tutoring, peer support, and mentorship to raise their GPA at least in the first six months or first full semester while allowing them to participate in the extracurricular activities and that those students meet with a college and career advisor to ensure they have a plan after graduation. I'll be honest that I really had to sit with this issue since I know extracurricular activities provide joy and academic benefits, but our kids are the ones that will get a quick reality check when they graduate from high school unprepared. All kids are capable of learning, I know we can all agree on that, and we must build engagement and nurture potential, but if we continue to lower the bar, we are doing them a disservice. And in the couple of seconds that I have left, I will say that in what you're hearing today from unsafe learning environments, I beg you all to take action before the summer. Because we can talk about this in August, but just because the summer happens doesn't mean it's gonna go away. When we come back in August for back to school, we're gonna have the same issues and they're gonna persist and they're gonna keep getting worse. And to say that we need more college counselors is not a solution because there's a shortage. So I need us to really think out of the box to what the solutions are gonna be and to bring community to the table to have open conversation so we can all work on this together. It's not all on you, it's gonna be on us parents as well to show up. Thank you. That was our last in-person speaker. Mackie will take it from here. Mr. Lucas, we have two virtual speakers joining us this evening. Our first speaker virtually is Mr. Jerron Tross. Mr. Tross, if you could go ahead and unmute and turn your camera on if you'd like, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Deron Tross. Uh, I live in Waldorf, Maryland. Oh, thank you for maintaining the civility during the campaign season. Unfortunately, Dr. Navarro refuses to stay neutral. Several weeks ago, several months ago, I was at an event and uh, I had some campaign branded hand sanitizer some folks needed. Dr. Navarro refused to hand sanitize it and she said it would appear, appear to be an endorsement. And I fully understand. However, Dr. Navarro attended an, an, an event that was in the community hosted by two citizens that are running for school board. And uh, I understand that's not considered as bias. Not only did Dr. Navarro attend, she invited her staff. Uh, since then, those, there are images floating around social media with Dr. Navarro and staff at this event. 2004, 14, during the primary, our former suit leader, Dr. Hill, did a robocall, and in my opinion, influenced the results of the election. This right there, uh, I thought was a, a fresh set of new eyes uh, by electing Dr. Navarro. However, this is a peer was not the case. Dr. Navarro has stuck her nose in the affairs of the community. This is not fair. And I thought, again, it would be uh, a fresh set of eyes. Dr. Navarro and her staff needs to be, uh, maintain neutrality by not attending political events, especially when inviting staff. That right there, uh, personally, I've lost a lot of respect for Dr. Navarro for sticking her nose into political business. Secondly, there was an event, a situation that happened at Tom Stone where a principal was injured. Come on, you're gonna have the students who injured uh, a staff member write a letter of apology. It's not right. You need to, you need to, some things that need to be addressed. You know, we need to take back our schools. Lastly, the situation at uh, Westlake, we know there's a letter that went out. Um, of course, I knew about it weeks ahead of time. Uh, you know, Dr. Averro, you and your staff need to spend more time making our schools safe, that our babies are not being targeted by sexual predators. Lastly, the situation at Westlake is not the last one. There's another one brewing. So again, Dr. Navarro, you need to tighten up the background check. Do your job and not attend political events. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tross. Our next speaker this evening is Melissa Wilson. Ms. Wilson, if you want to go ahead and unmute and turn your camera off if you'd like, please. Hi, my name is Melissa Wilson, and I'm a second grade teacher. Um, I came today to talk about teacher retention and I asked a bunch of teachers. I came up with a list of solutions and I will definitely send that list, but it didn't feel true to me. Um, so I wrote a poem. Well, they could have been a good teacher. If there was transparency about where we're at, 
If we could real talk about what the schools need, the teachers need, the students need, the families need, the community, if we felt we wouldn't be reprimanded, sued, hit, yelled at for being truthful at a meeting for today, I could have been a good teacher. If college had taught me that explicit, systematic, phonic, and phonemic awareness instruction was imperative to learning to read. If I hadn't inherited a classroom, grade, or school where 70% of my students are not proficient readers. If I had had that knowledge 10 years ago, if I'd had a mentor, I could have been a good teacher. If I didn't spend every school year trying to stop students from throwing chairs, kicking, flipping desks, cursing, or crying for hours a day, most days of the week, year after year. If there wasn't violence in every school down every hallway. If I felt safe. If I didn't feel like I have PTSD from the trauma and pain of knowing the trauma my students are enduring or the trauma that they endure at home. If I wasn't afraid of being shot, if schools weren't relied upon for more than we were ever designed to provide, I could have been a good teacher if I was able to give them everything they needed. I could have been a good teacher if I hadn't gone through five teams, three sets of administration, three superintendents, two school counselors, three school sites in 10 years years, if I'd been with a team long enough or given enough time out of my workday with them to engage in quality professional development, team planning, if I'd been provided enough time for grading, planning, or the hours of phone call to parents every week. I could have been a good teacher if I had had enough time. I could have been a good enough teacher, but I can't say that anymore. I was proud to be a teacher. But teaching has become painful for my health, my heart, my family's financial well-being. What I feel is at the heart of all of my coworkers. I don't know what to call myself now. I told everyone proudly that I was a teacher, but I am the primary breadwinner, and I cannot sustain this any longer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Okay, we're gonna move on to action items now. We have uh, approval of minutes. We have board minutes from the 10th of May. Motion to accept the minutes for May 10th, 2022. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, we have the executive session minutes from the 10th of May. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. We have the first set of executive session minutes from the 23rd of May. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Wilson, seconded by Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. And then the second set of executive minutes from the 23rd of May. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Abel, seconded by Mr. Hancock. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's everyone except for Ms. Battle Lockhart. Is this the public meeting? No, the executive, executive session. So now is the public meeting on the 23rd, work session minutes from the 23rd of May. Okay. Need a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. McGraw and seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. 
right, now we'll move on to personnel. Motion to approve personnel. Second. Made by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Wilson. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Now we have the uh, daily hour, daily and hourly tuition and wage rates, which we saw earlier today. We need a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Brown. Is there any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. I'm going to abstain. I was okay. missing during that. That's portion. right. So Mr. Hancock was not here. Unanimous amongst the voting board members. <coughs> then we have the FY 2023 budget. So moved. That's Second. It's moved by Ms. Um, McGraw and seconded by Ms. Abel. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, it's unanimous among voting members. Thank you. Okay, now we have the policies, and um, I think we probably want to take these one at a time. Okay, so. So, uh, board policy. 1314, which had changes just to remove a title that uh, we no longer have in the organization. Motion to accept policy 1314. Second. It's made by Ms. Wilson, seconded by um, Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Now we have policy 3430. Same type of change. So moved. Second. It's moved by Ms. Brown, seconded by Ms. Wilson. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. We have uh, policy 3533.1. That is a new policy, which is now required by the state. Mr. Andritz presented that to us. So moved. Second. It's moved by Ms. Abel and seconded by uh, Ms. Wilson. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And thank you. It's everyone except for um, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Any opposed? Okay. No one opposed. Next is policy 5127. Motion to approve. Second. That is made by Mr. Hancock and seconded by uh, Ms. Brown. Discussion? All those in favor, seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That's everyone except for Ms. Battle Lockhart. Any opposed? No one opposed. Next is policy 6412.4. Um, this has to do with um, parental request for alternate materials. Motion to approve. It's made by Ms. McGraw. Second. Seconded by Ms. Brown. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is Mr. Hurd, Ms. Brown, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Battle Lockhart, and Ms. McGraw. All those opposed? Mr. Hancock, Ms. Abel, and myself. Board policy 6425. 
which again was um, just changing the title from Assistant Superintendent of Instruction to Chief of Teaching and Learning. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Wilson and seconded by Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous from everyone. Thank you. Uh, policy 6462, same thing, just changing a title in the policy. Motion to approve. Made by Ms. McGraw, seconded by? I second. Uh, by Ms. Wilson. No, any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> that is unanimous among everyone. Thank you. And finally, uh, 9350. Which is bylaws of the board appeals uh, to the board of education. Motion to approve. Made by Ms. McGraw. Second. Seconded by Ms. Brown. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, it's Mr. Hurd, um, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, myself, Ms. Wilson, Ms. McGraw. All those opposed. Uh, Ms. Sorry, Ms. Abel. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Opposes Ms. Abel. Right. Uh, that is it for. Oh, it, right. I'm sorry. Okay. No, did I miss something? No, you're good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Keep it straight. All right. So uh, the last thing is the educational facility master plan. So moved. Second. It's moved by Ms. Wilson and seconded by Ms. McGraw. All those in favor, please show. It's uh, Ms. McGraw, Ms. Abel, Ms. Wilson, myself, Ms. Brown, Mr. Hancock. Student member does not vote. Any opposed? No one opposed. All right. Next thing on my agenda says adjournment. So moved. <laughs> Second. Seconded by, moved by Ms. Wilson, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, yeah. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much, folks. Drive home safely. Have a good night. Kyle, we're done.